So good evening, everyone. My pleasure to uh, welcome my friend and collaborator, Henrik Ulbricht, to give today's Osmo lecture. Henrik is professor of physics at the University of Southampton, where he leads the quantum nanophysics and matter wave interferometry research group. Henrik obtained his undergraduate degree in physics from the Technical University at Berlin and the Albert Einstein Institute in Golm in 2000 with a theoretical work on black hole thermodynamics. He graduated with a PhD from the Free University of Berlin and the Fritz Haber Institute of the Max Planck Society in 2003 with a work on experimental surface science in the group of Nobel laureate Gerard Ertl. This was followed by a postdoc position at Vanderbilt University in Nashville and a senior postdoc and assistant professorship at the University of Vienna. Henrik's main research interests concern experimental tests of fundamental physical theories by tabletop experiments and also in space. Some tests are concerned with the large mass limit of the quantum superposition principle. Other experiments are concerned with testing the interplay between quantum mechanics and gravitation in the low energy limit. Henrik's group performs quantum mechanical, ex quantum experimental research on the preparation and analysis of massive systems in non-classical states using various techniques. The pioneered so-called levitated opto and magnetomechanics experiments, where light and magnetic fields are used to both trap and control nano and microparticles in vacuum. Henrik has over 80 research publications in prestigious journals. Some of his recent works include non-interferometric tests of collapse models, probing modified gravity with levitated resonators, tests of gravity-induced wave function collapse, quantum technologies in space, and testing the Andrew effect using atoms in cavities. The diversity and scope of these experiments is truly breathtaking. I've known Henrik for over 10 years now, and for me, he's an ideal go-to experimentalist for discussing tests of new ideas. Over to you, Henrik. Yeah, uh, thanks TP, that, that was an uh, amazing introduction. Thanks a lot for this. Uh, there's not much I can add in my talk now, huh? so. <laughs> no, no, go ahead, please. Yes. Go ahead. Okay, good. Yeah, thanks Thanks for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to talk about um, the experiment. I mean, just let me know when the time is up. Um, I have like um, lots of slides. I, I think I will finish at some point, but if it's getting- You have, you have an hour, you have an hour or even more. Okay, yeah. good, yeah. No, I, I don't want to take too much time off people. I know it's, you know, these online meetings, they can be quite uh, exhausting. So I will try to keep it uh, as close and as short as possible. Um, so yes, yeah, I, I will talk about the experiments. So some of the experiments we, are, we, are, we, are, we did and some which are in, in preparation at the moment. So we are working on, um, you know, different, different platforms. Um, and the, the main goal is basically to test, uh, you know, quantum mechanics in the lab. And that's how, how I met TP. So there's a lot of, um, you know, experiments. We, um, some of them we, we did, many more we basically thought about theoretically. Uh, and that was about, uh, you know, testing collapse models, CSA type collapse models. Um, and we uh, we are basically trying interferometric and non-interferometric. So for for people who know what the difference is, and um, um, but then also of course the question with these um, you know large mass systems is uh, you know if gravity plays a role at some point. So it, you know is it gravitational decoherence or you know if you have a, a large mass quantum system, how how does gravity start to to come come into the the, the game and we try to to push the experiments uh, in 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 that direction, which is you know low energy, non relativistic, but it is ideally in 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 a, in a regime where there's sufficient mass so that gravity acts, um, and there is um, uh, you know still so much quantum control that you can prepare uh, non classical states like uh, you know superposition states and uh, things like that. So okay, so I I just click through the slides. Um, the, the two experiments at the beginning, I maybe skip this, which are slightly different. Here's the outline of the talk. So I will give you just two 
uh, cartoons, basically snapshots of, of ideas uh, for experiments, which are like, um, you know, uh, quite challenging. And uh, the, the experimental work we're doing is working towards those, um, you know, um, experiments and, and try to take steps and, um, uh, and, and, and build systems which can, which can uh, uh, perform these experiments. So we, uh, as TP also mentioned, we do um, optical levitation experiments. So basically use laser light to trap uh, silica, so that's glass, uh, nanoparticles and we do this in vacuum chambers and then uh, monitor and control and manipulate the motion the center of mass motion of these um, of these objects and I will show you some some examples of experiments we did and how that links basically to those fundamental physics tests and uh, then also we did that's the third point here I hope you can see my cursor um, it's the Meissner trapping um, of ferromagnetic microparticles so that's again um, all, all these particles, they're called levitated particles, which maybe sounds more spooky than it is. It's basically just trapping, um, you know, uh, uh, particles which are large if you compare them to atoms. Yeah? So they consist of many, many atoms and they have, um, they have a mass of, uh, I don't know, 10 to the 15 or so atomic mass units if they're 100 nanometer in, in, in diameter. Um, there's also, and I'm, I'm not sure if I will talk much about it, but there's also like a third levitation or trapping platform, which is a Paul iron trap. And that, of course, um, I guess many of you will, will know this from, you know, atomic iron trapping, you, you generate um, uh, AC fields uh, with, with, with electrodes, with blades, and you, you can, uh, if you do it in the right way, you can use it to trap particles. And again, you can uh, you can use it. So the, I think one could say the main goal is that you you get these kind of, some people call them mesoscopic particles, they're 100 nanometer in diameter or up to a micron. Um, and then you want to basically keep them in, 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 uh, in free space, yeah, ideally, and you want to study the, um, the motion, the evolution, the dynamics of these particles. And um, so um, the, the first step you have to do is you have to trap them, you have to levitate them, and then you do it in a clean environment, you do it in a cryostat, it's low temperature, you do it in ultra high vacuum, so you have no gas background, which is, you know, uh, giving you uh, collisions with, with gas and um, all of these things. So there are um, here three basically candidates, the optical trapping, the magnetic Meissner trapping, and the, the Paul ion trapping, which, uh, which we're doing. So I will, I will talk about these things. First, uh, for, for the motivation. So basically the thing which we ultimately want to do at some point um, is uh, to uh, answer this, uh, you know, rather old question, uh, how does the gravitational of a quantum superposition actually look like? So, you know, uh, as, as a first indication of, um, you know, what, what is it with gravity? And uh, is, is, there, is there like any kind of experiment we can do to, to look into this, into, um, the gravity which is which is generated by a quantum system. So what I mean by this is, uh, as it's indicated here by by this cartoon on the top part uh, of of the slide, you have a, a single particle which you put in a spatial superposition, um, and then you want to measure the gravitational field um, or the gravitational potential or you know uh, which is generated uh, by by this. Um, by the superposition and uh, that, that's an experiment which has never been done. And we simply have no clear experimental answer of how that may look like. So, you know, I guess everyone or almost everyone would expect that it's, um, you know, also uh, like in, in the electromagnetic case, uh, you know, the field uh, is, is also in a superposition. But then there are some ideas, including those of by, by, by Roger Penrose, that, uh, that only works up to a certain limit and then at some point space time. Uh, is unhappy and uh, you know it, it prefers to switch into uh, you know a, a kind of a classical state and it, it is not uh, happy to be in a in a superposition. So that is basically um, the idea is to learn something new about gravity, um, which is which you know is is generated by these larger masses. And um, yes, yeah, so that is that that's one experiment uh, we try to do. And of course, the the way. Um, from a kind of um, you know uh, logical point of view, what you have to do is you have to first try to generate the superposition of of, of a large particle, and it, it it looks like that if you could do that with um, a nanoparticle, say, or 50 nanometer in diameter, 
then uh, you would be already in a regime where you would generate a gravitational field, which then could be detected by a second probe uh, particle. And, um, you know, I, I will show you some experiments which we are trying to do along those lines. And the second experiment, and that, um, you know, has, has uh, um, you know, uh, quite a history now. So there, there have been two proposals um, uh, some years back, maybe five, six years ago, uh, where, where the idea was if you um, basically could take two masses and you would isolate them very well and you would uh, generate now two superposition states. So each of those would be in a, in a superposition state individually. And then you would bring them so close together that they can interact by gravity. Um, and then, you know, it is in, in a kind of free falling situation. And then the question is if the gravity is then able to entangle these two, um, uh, these two states. Um, so you would basically need to, you know, close these interferometers and then uh, also recombine somehow this correlation measurement between one of the two masses and then, uh, you know, basically answer the question if gravity is able to entangle, um, you know, this, 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 you know, some degrees of freedom of these two masses. Yeah. So is, is gravity basically um, um, a quantum channel in this way that it can um, uh, entangle two states. And, um, you know, there has been a discussion which is like very healthy and fruitful. And there are lots of opinions, of course, on, on one hand, uh, you know, what is the expected uh, result of this experiment and what would be learned from it? So if, if is, is it really true that if we could indeed generate such an entanglement by, by a sheer gravitational interaction, it, would that mean that, you know, gravity has to be uh, some sort of quantum entity yeah? and uh, there, you know there are different opinions I, I i find it really great that people discuss it what i'm of course mostly interested in is uh, you know the technical side and to, to think about how to do that experiment and that that's for sure very very challenging and uh, again you see that you know the, the first generating a superposition will then uh, be a precursor of the second one because you need it uh, also in the second protocol but that that um, I hope gives you some sort of flavor of what what are the types of experiments which we want to do. And again, these are challenging experiments. So the expectation is that um, they they maybe start to work in like five to ten years. Yeah? So uh, there's uh, quite a bit of work which has to be done. And of course, I should mention that there's there's a community and a growing community of experimentalists who were getting interested in in these kind of experiments and. Um, that's also great to see, yeah, so that, that that people are, you know, getting interested in these kind of questions and also um, having trust in their experiments that they can be pushed in in a, in a regime where you can do um, these, uh, uh, you know, gravity of quantum system uh, systems experiments. Okay, good. So now um, here's an example of um, uh, one experiment we, which we are building here in Southampton, and that is uh, to generate uh, uh, a, a superposition state of a, in this case, 20 nanometer um, nanoparticle. So that's an, a proposal which we wrote um, already almost 10 years ago, um, and it basically uses you see a sketch here of the of the configuration. So that it starts with an optically levitated uh, glass. Uh, particle, so 20 nanometer silica particle, which is optically trapped uh, or levitated, and then uh, you you have to perform uh, some some operation, some cooling on the center of mass motion, which which now has been developed, so uh, we can cool the the motion of uh, these these particles to millikelvin, and and two groups um, can even cool them to the quantum ground state. So uh, that is. Uh, it, it took about a decade to, to do that, but that is now technology which is available. So we can uh, basically um, make this a very point-like source. Yeah? So you can define basically from where this particle starts, and then you turn off the, the optical trap, the particle drops through um, a grating. So that is um, you know, um, a, a very straightforward way to do interferometry. So you, you basically do a young stubble slit experiment with um, um, a particle which is very large. So you, you use um, a laser light, which is back reflected, the standing light uh, grating as, as the diffractive element, as your um, uh, double slit, if you want. And then uh, this is where you generate the superposition. And then it needs some time, which in this case, because we're we are doing it in the so-called Talbot regime. So that is, you know, um, a kind of near field diffraction 
regime, which is also used for molecular interference experiments in uh, Markus Arndt's group in Vienna. Uh, so we have basically borrowed these, these ideas from there. And uh, then you need a certain time or distance between the generation of the state and the detection so that the state can basically evolve. And you know, for a larger mass, it takes longer and longer. It's the same um, you know, kind of state evolution which you, which you get from, from Schrödinger dynamics, of course. Um, but in this case, you can uh, quantify it with a nice uh, analytic expression as a type of time or type of distance, and that you know corresponds to roughly thirty centimeters. Yeah. So this experiment from the source to the detector is uh, two times thirty centimeters, so sixty centimeters, something like this. And you have to drop a, a single twenty nanometer particle over this distance, and then of course you get only one detection point. Uh, which contributes to your interference pattern. So the interference pattern would be like a cross section of this quantum carpet. So it would be like a, a line cut through this and then you would get the distribution, which is of course the typical interference fringe. So you have some regions where you accumulate many particles and then you have some where there's almost none. And um, so if you now do a single particle experiment, you get just one measurement point uh, in of your uh, interference pattern and to get some statistics so that you can uh, say there's really an interference pattern, you, you need to re redo this, repeat this with, uh, I don't know, 10,000, 100,000, a million uh, nanoparticles. And that is is indeed like the big challenge uh, which we have uh, uh, in, in building these experiments because loading the next nanoparticle with the best we can do takes, uh, I don't know, 10, 10 uh, minutes. And if you want to do 1 million experiment and the, the cycle of one is 10 minutes, then uh, you, you you can easily calculate that it takes too long to get uh, in a pattern. So we have to do uh, you know something more clever. And what we what we're doing at the moment is we call it throw and catch. So we basically have our optical trap, and we uh, launch a particle and we kick it upwards, uh, and then recapture it. And then when the particle is on the you know just the turning point, we fire the laser uh, for the grating, and then we detect the particle in the trap. So there's like an uh, improved uh, geometry, uh, which is you know not not that nice and straightforward anymore, but it allows us to do many more particles uh, in in a short time and to to get some statistics. So that's on a way we have basically um, uh, demonstrated that we can have the initial trap and we can cool to make it a point like source, and we can um, also detect it. So we have shown that we can do the detection with a high enough spatial resolution, and now we have to implement the grating and um, and do the experiment so um, that is that is an experiment which we do here in the lab and um, building it and putting it together what is also interesting and you see here uh, on, on the right hand side the, the black um, um, illustration that is um, an alternative way uh, you know to, to do it and it would be um, if you think about it what is actually limiting us in doing the experiment is that the particle um, we need the particle to be in free motion, so we cannot do it in a trap to allow for a large enough um, size of the of the superposition. And what we, um, you know, the, the the problem we have is that actually because of you know Earth's gravity, everything drops, right? So you and you you need to keep it somehow. If you think about you know having some sort of trap or some some kind of you know um, field which is keeping the particle in place, then uh, you can easily calculate that uh, you can never do this because you need uh, such a low noise uh, trap that would basically always decohere your superposition state. So you really have to turn everything off and let this particle go and just be in free fall. So now what is natural in um, you know trying to do is to try to do this in space on a satellite where you have much longer free evolution times. Um, uh, so an intermediate step is maybe to do it on, on one of these trapped, drop towers where you have free fall times of up to 10 seconds. And uh, we are very actively doing this. Indeed, we have actually one, and that's my last slide. If I make it to the last slide, we have one um, a, a space mission on a, on a platform. In one year, we will bas basically bring one of these experiments on, on an orbit and we will try to do interferometry. So that is absolutely crazy. And uh, everyone I, I talk to, they say, oh my God, that uh, must be so difficult to do. And it, it's of course true, but we are, we are trying to, um, you know, to do it, and uh, uh, we are, you know, optimistic. Yeah, so um, and we, we we think uh, we have a good shot here, and we can 
we can do it. Okay, so that is that's the that's the interferometer. Just to give you also a flavor, that's like the type of uh, of experiment we're doing, and it starts with these levitated particles. So you basically isolate them completely from from the environment, and then you try to um, act on them in a very specific way to prepare those uh, you know non-classical states like like this superposition or if you want the Schrödinger cat state. Yeah. Um, okay, so. Here's a different type of experiment. So that is also, um, um, you know, something we are, we are actively, actively uh, building. Um, and that comes more from like a macroscopic large mass regime. And that is to directly uh, probe and, and measure gravity and gravitational effects. And the classic way to do it is of course, you have a two particle system. One acts as your source mass uh, that generates an, a gravitational field. And then you have a second which is your um, your probe system or your your detection system, and that is now, you know, carefully or precisely measuring um, what is the the gravity from the other particle acting acting on itself. And here you see um, such an experiment. So there is um, again, it's a schematic. Um, you you would have uh, this here as as your source particle, which you would modulate. So you would basically apply a little bit of um, a magnetic or electric field, and you would uh, shake it, so you would move periodically um, the uh, the position of this particle, and then um, that would modulate the gravity uh, 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 which is generated by this particle. And then you have the second particle, which is the pro particle, and you would basically try to pick up now this gravity modulation at the frequency of the modulation. Yeah. So, um, you know that that's an experiment which people have done uh, with you know, macroscopic masses. The most famous is, of course, uh, actually, yeah, Cavendish is, 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 is a bit different. So you don't have this modulation of the of the mass, which is a very clever feature of the Cavendish experiment. Um, if I have time, I, I come back to Cavendish because we, we're trying to do like a microscopic version of Cavendish experiment. Um, but again, so also in Cavendish, you have basically two masses and you, um, you have a very sensitive probe mass, which you, want to use to basically detect gravity, which is generated by, by a different mass. So, so again, the platform we're using is um, um, this Meissner levitation. So we have lead uh, traps, we have um, 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 superconducting um, lead traps, and uh, we trap a permanent, a permanent magnets, ferromagnets, um, and they're levitated by, by the Meissner effect. So you know the 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 magnet generates a magnetic field, and the ideal diamagnet of the of the superconductor is repelling or opposing this magnetic field, and that forms a trap. And if you uh, give it the shape of a cup, then you have confinement in all three directions, um, and that's very well isolated. You can, for instance, also use the superconducting uh, walls between the particles to uh, remove drastically, if not completely, turn off all electromagnetic interaction because um, you know. I didn't say it, but what we want to do is we want to make these masses both very, very small, so on the order of milligram. And that means that in order to have a chance to detect gravity, we have to bring them rather close together. And then, of course, we know that there are many other interactions which can be easily much stronger uh, than gravity, which is, you know, Casimir forces or uh, Van der Waals forces or these kind of electromagnetic, uh, uh, you know, uh, whatever dispersion interactions. Yeah. Um, so, but again, so that, that's, that's the platform and um, that's the other type of experiment we're doing. So we have the, the gravity experiments, which are more from the macroscopic side and we try to reduce the mass to make them smaller and smaller and see if we can still detect, um, you know, gravity. So if you have a, um, you know, 10 microgram uh, particle, then it's Planck mass. I don't know if there's the expectation that anything spectacular should happen there. Uh, maybe not, but that is like the regime we want to approach and want to see, you know, how, how is gravity behaving there? There's, there's no experiment which has ever, you know, probed this kind of mass regime. And uh, so, um, yeah, that, that's what we're doing. And on the other side, we have uh, these quantum systems, these nanoparticles, which we put in interferometers to, to generate non-classical states. And then we hope that at some point, you know, the uh, superposition uh, states uh, become more massive, more massive, and the gravity systems become, you know, smaller mass. And at some point, they overlap, and we can do an experiment where actually both existing at the same time. The quantum superposition 
and uh, you know the gravity interaction uh, in a kind of detectable way. Yeah. Um, so let's see what's on the next slide. Um, now I talk about the experiments. So the first is uh, optical levitation, just to um, give you some idea of uh, you know what that is. So it's an optomechanical system. Maybe the most famous optomechanical system is of course LIGO gravitational wave detector, where you have um, you know a Michaels and interferometer with these end mirrors, which are um, you know coupled uh, to to the to the laser interferometer, and um, you do very precise measurements of strain sensitivity of you know how how basically space time is is changing when the gravitational wave comes in, and then you measure in two uh, orthogon orthogonal directions, and you can um, you know reproduce a signature of uh, I don't know a binary which is merging, and and uh, um, you know we we know the story. But the important thing is that you basically use light, you use uh, laser light, electromagnetic light, and you couple it directly to uh, the motion of a mechanical object. And um, here's uh, again a, a cartoon um, of of some of these uh, platforms. So um, a very early one was, you know, you have basically a laser which is uh, bounced off a cantilever which has a mirror attached to it, and then there's like a second mirror and this mirror and the one on the on the cantilever they form a cavity. And now if uh, you know this mirror is moving because the cantilever is maybe you know oscillating, then that changes directly the optical mode in the cavity. So the mechanic mechanical motion has a strong effect on the optical field in the cavity, but also the other way is, is right. So if you have sufficient intensity and the light is now by light pressure pushing against the cantilever, then that is now ch also changing um, the mechanical properties or the mechanical motion of the cantilever. And that is an optomechanical coupling. And um, that is what you know m many experiments are about. And um, you know people have pushed these kind of optomechanical systems into the quantum regime. So that means that the mechanical oscillator is in, in a quantum mechanical ground state or in a I don't know, in, in, in a number state um, or in, in, in a superposition state. And you can use the light um, to, um, to, to uh, generate very interesting mechanical states. Yeah? And um, you, you, what you use is this coupling between um, electromagnetic radiation and, and the mechanical motion. So a specific case of this is, you see it also here on this picture that is from one of Lukas Novotny's um, publications, and I have stolen it. Uh, shamelessly. Um, so one one specific configuration is of an optomechanical system is that you use laser light to trap a particle. Yeah. So you have it can be in, in, a, a tweezer, an optical tweezer, which is nothing else than a lens or an uh, you know an, an, another optical element which is focusing light, and then in the focal spot of the laser light you trap um, uh, a single particle and you. Um, uh, you know, detect, use the same laser to detect uh, now the motion um, of, the, of the particle in the trap. And that turns out to be the best harmonic oscillator you can, you can build. And uh, you can study, you know, very nice physics, which also is, is good for us because we, we always want to do harmonic oscillators because that's the, the best model we, we have and uh, we always apply to everything. Um, so, uh, we, we, we have it, it in one of these optical tweezer labs. Here's, here's the, the uh, specific configuration of our experiment in Southampton. So we use actually not the lens, but a parabolic mirror uh, to focus the light uh, that has a very high numerical aperture, close to one, um, which means is that we can focus light really tightly to an, an almost diffraction limited spot. So, you know, just uh, to give you some numbers. So we can trap the nanoparticles, which range from some 10 nanometer in diameter up to some 100 nanometers. It's silicon, it's silica, so silicon dioxide, glass. Um, and we can do this in vacuum. So we can go down to 10 to minus 9 millibar, which is, again, very important parameters if, if we think about um, these kind of interferometric schemes uh, to generate like macroscopic superpositions of these nanoparticles. Um, so that you, you have to do it in vacuum, otherwise uh, the background gas pressure will decohere your state very uh, rapidly. Um, uh, there is a specific way we use to detect this. It, it actually turns out to be um, an interferometric detection. I can come back to this if you're interested. I'm, I'm not sure, so I spare those technical details for now. 
and move on and show you like an, um, uh, a little illustration of some of the experiments which we did um, in, um, in the past, what is it? Yeah, maybe almost 10 years now. Um, so here you see uh, on, on the left-hand side, you see again, our parabolic particle trap. So there sits um, a hundred nanometer particle that is inside the vacuum chamber. So here you see an, an optic setup under B of this, um, uh, of this illustration. And we have a laser, which is coupled in focused by the parabola. Then we trap particle. Um, the particle really scatters light. And that is what we capture by a photodiode. And then we uh, have a signal, which is basically just the particle moving in a trap. Yeah, so over time, it is a sine wave, uh, which is now the position of the particle in the trap, and that's our harmonic oscillator. And what we now do is we take the sine wave and put it into some electronics. Uh, again, I don't go too much into detail, but it could be a locket amplifier or some other filter. We also have done Kalman filters, which is you know more advanced stuff. And you can you you, you can generate a signal, which you then use to modulate the light which goes in the trap. Yeah, so there you can basically modulate the potential. So you can, uh, your, your harmonic potential can be uh, very deep or very shallow depending on um, how, how much light you send into the trap and that you can use to, to modulate um, the, the, the harmonic oscillator, the oscillating particle in the trap. So um, what you typically get, that's the position motion here over time in, in A and in C, you see the Lorentz transform, which is a nice Lorentzian that's of course you know, the Fourier transform of an harmonic oscillator of a sine curve, that's what we expect it to be. Um, so we can trap it, we can detect the particle, we can cool the particle, we can, I mentioned already that just by doing a, a feedback of this type, you can cool to the ground state, uh, which is for the systems on the order of uh, 10 micro Kelvin. Um, what you also can do is you can, uh, you know, by for instance, fast switching, um, between two different frequencies of the harmonic oscillator, you can squeeze the motion. So you're actually not squeezing light, but you're squeezing directly the mechanical motion of the oscillator. And you see here um, a phase space plot of an initially almost, you know, spherical thermal state. And then here it is after the squeezing operation, it is, uh, you know, the typical elliptic skate, uh, um, the typical elliptic shape. And that's, that's, that's quite interesting because you can use it um, you know, to, to have the particle exploring larger amplitudes. So it moves basically a larger distance. And what that means is that um, you, have, you have a trap and it is um, an harmonic trap, but it's made by a Gaussian beam, which means that, you know, you have a nice linear dependency close to the center. But if you go, you know, further to the wing, then it becomes nonlinear. And you can, if you squeeze basically, um, a particle, if you allow for large amplitudes, then the particle explores these nonlinear parts and you can then, uh, you know, generate uh, or, or have these nonlinearities to play a significant role in the dynamics of the particle. And we, we want to use it, we're actually doing it right now in the lab to, to generate non-Gaussian states. Um, so, you know, use actively these nonlinearities in the motion to prepare interesting states of motion. Yeah. And we think that, you know, this is also actually an alternative way uh, to generate uh, non-classical or quantum states um, if you do it uh, simultaneously with cooling. So if you cool your oscillator and you use these non-linearities to, um, uh, to, to uh, you know, do state preparation, then we think you can, for instance, also uh, generate a superposition state in this way. And um, it's maybe not so super surprising if you think about it also non-linear optics um, which is used, for instance, to, to generate entangled photon pairs that is also using nonlinear interactions of light in, in, in crystals. Yeah? So we are basically, again, trying to translate these kind of nonlinear optics effects into nonlinearities non of our uh, harmonic oscillator system. Um, the, the, the system we have, these, these levitated particles are also great sensors, so they're very sensitive to forces and uh, acceleration. So here's an experiment which we did where we measured surface forces. So that's a silicon wafer, uh, you know, something which people use for nanofabrication and making all these fantastic microchips, which we're using in computers and, you know, nowadays much more advanced stuff. Um, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a single crystal of, you know, centimeter scale. So it's like a, a large 
object which has uh, you know very very atomically clean um, uh, structures. So what we did is we trapped uh, one of our silica, one of our glass particles, very close, some micrometer close to such a silicon wafer, and we um, basically observed that now the potential becomes unharmonic because of the force. So you now get an unharmonic oscillator, and you can of course see it in in the motion because then the amplitude you know is is, is asymmetric, and you can. Uh, measure this very precisely, and you can use it to actually uh, measure the interaction, measure the, the, this force which is acting on a particle. And we were hoping to get, you know, some interesting insight into Casimir forces. But what turned out to be the case here was that we had a charged particle, um, electrically charged particle, which was interacting with the image charge in the surface. So we basically measured a Coulomb interaction, but uh, you know, it was still in, a, a nice experiment. Um, you can also use electrical fields or magnetic fields to manipulate, to cool the motion, to uh, measure actually the number of charges on the particle. And, you know, there's, there's an example of this here. So um, maybe as, as the last uh, thing to mention, you, you can have, and you see an example here, uh, non-spherical particles in the trap. Yeah, so you, you can have these, these dumbbells, so like... Um, uh, I didn't talk about these, these details, but what, what we actually do is we have um, a solution of those nanoparticles and a water solution, and we spray the water solution in to the vacuum chamber, and then we trap from there. And what can happen is that in the solution, if it basically stays on the shelf for, for you know, um, a long time, then um, uh, these particles, they can cluster, they can agglomerate. And what you see here is those particle cluster. So there was originally basically two spherical particles, and there are now two which are glued together. And actually, it turns out the bond is quite strong. It's really like a chemical uh, bond, which is now forming this dumbbell. And if you have such a particle then uh, in a trap, then what it also does is it is actually driven by the polarization of the laser light. It is spinning in the trap. So on top of translation uh, degrees of freedom, you also have rotational ones. Um, and, and they're also very interesting because, you know, again, for the state preparation uh, effects, um, uh, they, they have nonlinearities, of course, and you can use those uh, to, to prepare specific states. And there are uh, interesting protocols how to use the rotation of those nanoparticles to do uh, quantum experiments. Yeah? So Ben Stickler has, uh, has very nice proposals uh, on this and uh, a number of people trying to, to do these experiments now. Um, Okay, yeah, here, here's actually um, a, a rotational experiment which we did. Uh, I don't know how we are doing in time. I have the feeling it's already like half an hour or so, maybe more. I, I cannot hear you, TP. Yeah, we have 20 more minutes. Okay, yeah, so I will we speed up a little bit. You know, I, I always get lost in these experimental details because that's what I do basically every day. <laughs> you no, have to I... forgive me. Um, so okay, so what what you what you see here is we, we actually had one of these uh, dumbbell structures and we um, we put it in a trap and you see there are like two traces we call it the power spectral density so that's basically the frequencies the Fourier transform um, of these um, uh, you know time traces which we measure and you see interesting resonances so here for instance you see omega z omega x and omega y and these are the translation motions yeah. The, the center of mass translation motion of the particle in all three spatial directions. And then you see, which is not very pronounced, but you also see alpha, beta, and gamma. So these are like, uh, you know, liberation motions. So like pendulum motions around all the three, um, or there are only two axes. And then you also see rotations around three axes. And now um, this was a lucky particle, which had like for the conditions we had in a trap showed um, you know, a spin, and you see here, these are is the spinning frequency gamma, omega gamma, which is spinning, um, you know, around one of the axes. I don't know which one it is at the moment, but it, it doesn't matter. Um, and it spins, and actually, uh, what you can do is if you then pump your vacuum chamber, if you reduce uh, the pressure, if you reduce the, um, the number of particles in a trap, then you reduce the friction force, which this particle sees when it spins, and it speeds up, it gets faster, and people could spin these nanoparticles up to gigahertz, which is like insanely fast. Uh, and it's only stopped by 
that um, you know the, the particle by by the centrifugal forces is teared apart, so it is losing atoms because uh, it's spinning so fast. And um, okay, so but what what then happened is that it is in a laser trap, and there's you know uh, one of these optical forces which you have there is the the scattering force. So there's basically light pressure which is pushing the particle all the time, and now you have a spinning particle, and it was pushed pushed by this uh, constant. Uh, light pressure and that uh, generated a precession motion. So we basically observed, and that's this feature here, um, that you know the particle was not only spinning, but it was basically doing a precession motion um, at at a much lower frequency, uh, and that was you know a, a great uh, result, which made us very very happy uh, at the time. Um, yeah, so I, I remember the PhD student Mudasa. He was like super happy and proud when he did the experiment, and he had a lot of fun with this. Yeah. Um, okay, so that, that's the stuff you can do. That's of course all in a way classical, and uh, but you know e even doing this um, is, um, is is fantastic experiments. Um, there's a platform I just wanted to briefly mention. This you can also use so-called meta lenses. So you can nanofabricate um, structures. So uh, you take one of these silicon wafers and you grow little nano wires on one side. And now you basically can use these nanowires and shine light on them. And then in the near field, each of those little nanowires um, imprints on this kind of local piece of light, which is there, a certain phase. And if you now orchestrate this all, so you put the pillars in a certain symmetry and in a certain arrangement, then they all contribute um, with their little phase to like the same, uh, uh, you know, big interference pattern. And that could be, for instance, a focal point. Yeah, you can. You can use this, uh, these nanofabricated structures to basically uh, focus light to, to make a lens. And uh, that's a very compact um, system and it has you know, very interesting features. And we, we use it for trapping. So we have here, that's an, uh, that's an example of an experiment Chuang did where he actually did a meta lens with two um, focal points. So you shine in light and the, um, the symmetry of those pillars is in a way that they focus in you know, equal amounts of light into two focal points and then you can trap, um, you can do many interesting things. So you have now a double well and you can have the particle moving and exploring the double well. And again, if you make the double well in the form that you basically have a big potential and just a little bump in, in the middle. Yeah? So you make the any, any energy barrier between the two wells very, very small. Then it is again, a nonlinearity which the particle just picks up when it's oscillating and you can use it for uh, you know, generating non-classical states. That's one of the things you want to do. Or you can have like two traps and you trap two particles and now you can try to entangle them and, you know, con control them in, 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 in that way. So, you know, just to mention, there's um, a lot of fantastic technology which is coming up and um, we, are, we are taking part in this and, you know, benefiting from, from these kind of, uh, you know, fabrication revolutions or whatever uh, you want to call it. Um, so uh, there's also rotation. I maybe skip skip this one. That's also a meta lens where you can use it to spin basically the particle. Um, this is now the other platform. So here's um, a diff the different trap which we're using, the Meissner trap. Um, so there we we levitate these uh, permanent magnets. So these are little neodymium uh, uh, ferrite boron magnets, which have typically a radius of ten. 10 to 100 micrometers. So they're larger than the ones which we have in the optical trap. And um, they sit in this, in this lead box. And if you pull lead below 10 Kelvin, it becomes a type one superconductor. Um, and if you do it in the right way, if you take care that there's no flux spinning and these kind of effects, then you have a very uh, clean system. Um, and it is also, you know, has a big advantage. It's, it is a passive system. So you don't actively um, like in the optical or also in the pole trap, you basically generate a field, which is then trapping your particle here. It is an induced effect based on the Meissner effect. And um, it turns out that that's super low noise. Yeah? So you can basically trap these, um, uh, these magnetic particles and uh, you can um, uh, do this in, 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 in very low noise conditions. So these are the best uh, candidates uh, for, for this gravity experiments because um, they're, they're very sensitive to, to measuring external forces because they have so little noise in, in their own motion. So what we, what we basically do is you have, uh, because this is because of the magnetic moment, so you have like a little vector sitting 
uh, in the trap. And also there you have XYZ translation motion, alpha, beta, gamma rotational modes. And you can see all of those by having a little antenna. So there's like a little superconducting coil, which we bring like millimeters close to the trapping position of the particle. And that's coupled to a squid, inductively coupled to a squid here. So the quantum, uh, uh, um, superconducting quantum interference device, which uh, you know, is, is one of the classic magnetometers. So what we're basically doing is we're measuring very precisely how the magnetic field is changing when this magnet is moving, yeah, when it's changing its position. And uh, again, it's a very high quality factor oscillator. That's like the technical way to say that's in a low noise system, which is very sensitive. Um, so there's the force noise. That's actually one, one thing which we are working on to test the CSL uh, things in a, in a noise uh, way, which, um, you know, um, at least one of us, uh, you know, is, is not believing that that is of any good use. Um, so, but it, it's basically looking for, for like noise in, 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 in these oscillators at very, uh, you know, environmentally low noise conditions. So in a cryostat, low temperature, ultra high vacuum, um, vibration isolated, uh, no electromagnetic radiation. And then you just watch and observe how your little particle moves. And if there's any kind of noise, there's of course always still some noise um, which is uh, which is affecting the motion, but then you want to set bounds and say, you know, there is uh, the noise level is now lower than ever before, and I have an oscillator which, you know, is affected by the noise in such such and such way. Um, actually, when you when you think about noise, you become very curious about noise sources. Yeah, where is it coming from? And I think that's a very fascinating question. And as an experimentalist, it's so easy to say, yeah, yeah, there's always noise, and you're interested in the signal. But I think it's quite interesting to look at noise and um, to you know try to understand what's the noise source and try to um, you know affect the noise source maybe and reduce it to to just understand um, the system better and better. Um, okay, so there is some experiments which we did there. I, I skipped this maybe. Uh, uh, there is uh, just to show you an example, um, one of the recent experiments which we did. Um, that is actually uh, work which we did with TP long, long time ago. Is if you look for these um, these noise effects, yeah, then uh, it turns out that the geometry of these, uh, you know, the particle where you look at the motion is very important. So the most sensitive configuration is um, a disk which is you know um, oscillating in in a kind of flapping liberation motion um, around one of the axes. And so here we have such an um, you know disk-like structure, and we see the mode spectrum. We understand the modes, and we um, uh, also you know try to cool the modes with some feedback. So there's there's a piezo, there's a mechanical actuator which is shaking the particle in one direction, and that is basically coupled um, to to the detection of the motion. So we shake it in a way which is somehow correlated to the oscillation of the particle, and if we do it. Uh, with the right phase shift, we can extract energy from from the motion of the particle and cool uh, in in this way. So that's called parametric feedback cooling. And um, so we have not like reached uh, a limit where we have a, like a spectacular result, which I could share with you. But I think we are on a good way, and we have um, you know some more traps in preparation where we hope that in the next uh, cool downs, which will happen in the next month, we maybe can. You know, put some new bounds on on those CSL models and see, um, uh, yeah, what what's going on there and what what the noise sources are. Um, that was the feedback cooling. That's how how it looks like if you if you act with the piezo on one of the PSDs. Again, I, I don't go too much into details. Um, that's the ring down times because it's a it's a low frequency oscillator. It actually takes a long time for it to stabilize, which is in a way annoying when you want to use it as a detector because it is such a low frequency oscillation. You have to wait for a long time to see any effect. Um, but there's some ways around it. You can, again, use feedback to actually push the system a little bit so that things happen faster. Um, but you don't want to do too much uh, to, to not spoil the quality factor. So, um, but still, it's an, it's an interesting system. Um, there's vibration isolation just to 
show you some example that is like the next step which we're doing that is uh, vibration isolation which was developed for LIGO for the for the end mirrors which they have so-called gas filters so they inverted springs and they can attenuate vibrations by um, here it says even the factor what is it 10,000 uh, at 10 hertz yeah so it, basically you you can reduce uh, vibrations which come from the outside to your experiment and you can um, do the experiment at very clean uh, vibration uh, conditions. Um, here's an experiment which we actually did together with colleagues in Leiden, Jack Osterkamp's group. So uh, some of you may know him. So they're doing fantastic uh, low temperature experiments. Um, they have also done the, you again see in the middle of this uh, busy slide, you see um, a permanent magnet, which is in, in a lead trap. They actually use tantalum, which is also a type one superconductor. Um, so they have basically done a very similar experiment to the one I have explained to you before. And now they do it in, in a, a 10 millikelvin environment. So in a super fridge, and they also do it at uh, reduced vibration um, conditions. So they have very complicated vib vibration suspension system, which can isolate now this, um, you know, oscillating magnet from, from an environmental uh, motion. So what they also then did um, is uh, to have a, for a gravity experiment, I, I, I basically uh, told you that the way to do it is you have these two masses, one is the source mass, one is the probe mass. And what, what we did with Tiak is we had um, a kilogram uh, scale source mass, which was outside the cryostat. And actually there were three of them on a wheel which was an old uh, cycle wheel of Tiak's son, I think. Uh, and we were spinning it at close to resonance frequency of one of the modes of this oscillator here. And we measured gravity. Yeah, that's the plot which you see here. And um, so that's in, that's in uh, I don't know if there's a number. So yeah, that is 200 or 300 atto Newton is the gravitational force which was measured. So that's quite a small number. Yeah, so that's like an, a record small force measurement, gravitational force measurement. Um, now, unfortunately, you see that uh, the blue region in this graph, that is where you expect, according to Newton's law, gravity to be. Yeah? And what we measure is slightly less. Yeah? And um, without uh, starting wild speculations, we, 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 we are relatively certain that it's an experimental effect. And the effect is this, that you see you have the cup, yeah, which is the trap, and now if you modulate the external mass, then actually what happens is that you also modulate or affect the cup. Yeah? So you not only shake your probe system, but you also shake the cup and the cup effect turns out to be a larger effect than the one which you measure. And um, that is why we think we, we are measuring basically the gravitational interaction slightly less than, than expected. So um, there's a new experiment which is improving it. So we call it the bucket problem. Um, and the bucket is now coupled to a much larger mass, which is higher up in the cryostat. And so that the, the source mass cannot shake basically the, uh, the bucket anymore, or that this shaking happens at very different frequency. Um, and um, we think with this, we can improve basically this measurement here. Um, yes, so, so that is, that's an experimental result and uh, it's on the archive, uh, the paper and we, um, we think that is like a first step and we have used for the first time a levitated sensor. So, you know, our magnet, which is here, that's our probe system. It's for the first time a levitated mass, which is used to detect uh, a gravitational force yeah, or gravitational interaction. Um, okay, so now uh, that's the, the Cavendish story. So again, to, to avoid the bucket problem, you maybe want to do it in a way uh, which uh, is not using this resonance effect. Yeah? So you don't want to shake your, um, your source mass to then see an effect in the probe mass. So you want to do it in a very clever way, which you know, Cavendish already did a long time ago. So the, the more I think about this experiment, the more I appreciate how actually genius this configuration is. Um, and you see here, it is a cartoon of, of an experiment which we are setting up in one of our four Kelvin experiments. So here you actually see in the photograph um, the arena, we call it the arena, that's a superconducting lead trap where we have a handlebar. And now by exactly the same Meissner effect, we will levitate the handlebar and that is our probe system. And then we have, um, you know, a, a, a mass modulation, which is, you know, at much lower frequency, we basically just change the position of this 
external mass. So there's one at the top and one at the bottom, and then we basically measure how um, you know the um, uh, the probe system is following the external mass, and we uh, at least on paper that should be uh, you know more sensitive, and we should be able to push uh, gravity detection to um, uh, to to Planck mass. So that means that the source mass will be on 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 the level of Planck mass, and um, yeah, so so that's that's the plan. We we know for sure that we need this super duper uh, vibration isolation, which I showed you before. Um, so we have to do a lot of things to to get this experiment running. But uh, we have at least, let's say, um, an an idea for a configuration where we can attempt such a test um, of gravity. Uh, I don't know, TP, how 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 much time is left. I think it's almost done. Huh? I, ca I cannot hear you. You have to turn your mic on, I guess. We have five minutes. Yeah. Ah, okay, five minutes. So then, okay, let let's let's do this as well. Um, there's actually interesting stuff if you have these permanent magnets. Yeah. So they, these is ten microns permanent magnets. We so have this uh, magnetic moment, and now it sits in a trap, and it is very well isolated, and it's a very clean oscillator. And you see again translation motion, but you also see rotations, and now. If you think about doing um, something which people always do in magnetic resonance, yeah, so you want to basically detect, for instance, a magnetic force. So what you could do is you could apply an external magnetic field, which is perpendicular to um, the direction of your magnetic moment. So magnetic moment is rotating. You turn on a magnetic field uh, in this direction. And then, of course, what you get is, again, precession um, of the rotation of the, of the, um, of the magnet. And the, that is then, uh, you know, in NMR or in magnetic resonance, that's called the Lamor um, precession. And the frequency, the Lamor frequency is a direct measure of the B field. Yeah? So you can basically, when you measure the Lamor frequency, you, you know uh, what, what the B field was, which, which, which was, was causing it. And um, the interesting thing now is that uh, what turns out is that this um, levitated magnets, they are the most sensitive magnetic field sensors ever. Yeah. So um, uh, on paper, again, we, we, we calculated this together with uh, Dimitri Budka and Derek uh, Kimball and uh, some other people which are all listed here. Um, and they're interested in magnetic resonance and these kind of you know, physical systems. Um, so what turns out is that these these little magnets that should be able to detect um, femto Tesla, yeah, ten to minus fifteen Tesla of magnetic field, and there's no other sensor, not NV center diamonds, not atomic vapors, not uh, squids, not you know you name the sensors. And it is even um, more interesting. There's one plot here which is from a review of modern physics from from Morgan Mitchell at ICWO, where he basically puts on a map all the existing. Um, sensors, magnetic field sensors, you see there are these symbols. These things here, this, that's just the explanation of the symbols. Yeah? So it's, for instance, that's an Hall sensor. So these you know, crosses, these are Hall sensors. So now if you plot um, the, the magnetic field noise, or if you want the lowest magnetic field, which these things have measured or can measure theoretically, versus um, uh, the um, the the effective size of the system, yeah. So that, that has something to do with a volumetric measure. Um, and then what you find is that all of these sensors are limited by the green line. So there's no sensor, no existing sensor which can be below the line. And that green line is called the energy resolution limit. So that basically means take a volume of your sensor, and um, I tell you with this limit what is like the minimum uh, magnetic field it can measure. Yeah. So it's a volume volume volumetric uh, uh, limit uh, of, of magnetic field sensor. And the interesting thing is, so you see the cross here, that is the prediction for the levitated magnet. So it's not bound by this, by this limit. And um, we don't fully understand why this is. We have tried to speculate in this paper a little bit that it has to do with that, what it actually is. If you have, a, if you have this, uh, you know, ferromagnets, you have an ensemble of uh, you know, spins which are aligned. Yeah, so the, the the material is magnetized, which means that microscopically all these many spins are aligned or polarized in the same direction. And of course, there is spin noise, which means that you know some of these spins may flip, but that is at very high frequency. That is like gigahertz or so. But the mechanical motion which we detect is at very low frequency. That is hundred hertz or even less. 
that means that you know all the noise which is in the spin system is not coupling to our detector to to the detection um, of of our magnetic particle yeah, in the effect. So it has to do with this um, you know wide separation of typically frequencies which are which are in the system, and actually the the uh, Morgan Mitchell um, he has done. Uh, an experiment with uh, atoms and optical lattices. So that's like a, you know, very nice and geo engineered many body uh, uh, system where you take uh, atoms and you put them in, in an optical lattice. So you can basically build something like an, um, a mini version of an, a crystal structure. Yeah, you can build crystals and you can, for instance, also make magnetic phases. So you can then manipulate each atom in a specific state so that as an ensemble, this becomes something like a ferromagnet. Um, and with this system, he gets the same kind of uh, low sensitivities. And he also finds that if he, if he, if he has a, a ferromagnet in his atomic many body system, that he is beating the energy resolution limit. Yeah? So there seems to be um, you know, some, some interesting thing there. And of course, we're, we're trying to do the experiment. So Andrea Vinante in Trento, um, uh, has has uh, you know made like very nice steps. So the first thing you have to do is you have to control the rotation motion of the magnet in the um, in in the trap, which is uh, not so easy because if if you do it at high frequency, they, these are actually bullets, little bullets. So if you if if they become unstable and they fire in one direction, um, I mean they're very small, but I think you you know you have to be careful a bit. That I guess let let, let me put it this way. Um, Okay, so here's the Paul trap. I think my time is mostly up just to, to say there's the Paul trapping stuff, which we also do. Uh, we, we trap, uh, again, silica particles, so 100-ish uh, diameter nanoparticles in these um, uh, electrodynamic traps. Uh, we do it in the fridge at 300 millikelvin. That was actually the, the tech experiment. So we have built this as part of a big European project together with experts who actually did give us uh, um, the, the Paul trap and super nice electronics, which is low noise um, for this. And we are also looking for, you know, noise um, in, in the oscillation of the particle in, in the trap. And uh, that's still ongoing. There again, some technical details, which I spare you at this time. Uh, there's a summary. So I have basically talked about the experiment. I hope I could illustrate a little bit um, what we're doing. So there's the optical trapping, the magnetic trapping. And then I mentioned just in passing the, the iron pole trapping. And with all of these systems, we have actually hopes that we can, you know, push from one end low to, you know, high, higher mass, uh, massive systems to lower masses to, you know, to uh, gravity experiments in a new way, in a new regime. And, um, you know, in, in, a, in a kind of different, um, environment, we also try to push up these, um, you know, quantum um, experiments to, to larger and larger systems, to more massive systems, and again, to hope uh, that they unite at some point, and may happen at Planck mass, who knows, and yeah. uh, then, then we can do experiments there, so that, that's the hope. Maybe that is the, the, the just because it's so exciting, that is um, uh, what we have just won uh, last month, it's the ESA payload masters competition. So they, they fly these orbiter NINX uh, in uh, next year with one of Elon Musk's uh, rockets. And uh, we have some space to put one of our optical traps on there and fly it on an orbit. And then they also will try to, to, to re-enter and to capture the capsule. So we may actually get the experiment back after that. So um, what we want to demonstrate is that these levitated experiments can be done in space. Yeah. And of course, because we're very ambitious people, we also try to do interferometry. So we will try to trap a particle and then turn off the trap. And the nice thing, if you're in free fall, is that of course the particle, you know, if you if you if you ignore all the other accelerations, which are maybe that a particle will just sit there, and then you can fire with the, your laser grating, and you can wait, and then you can detect, and then you 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 should be able to do many. Uh, you know, interference sequences uh, with, with, with the same particles. So that's what we try to do. That's the thank you slide to, uh, you know, people in the lab. So that's all PhD students and postdocs over the years. Um, also collaborators, TP is there. Many thanks to, to TP for like this longstanding 
collaboration and uh, all these nice discussions which we have about crazy ideas and you know some of them turn out to be actually quite quite good yeah okay yeah. cool thanks a lot that, that's me done yeah uh, thank you Henrik that was really exciting and like I said in the beginning the the scope and diversity of these experiments is breathtaking and congratulations on winning this space uh, experiment opportunity is perhaps it will be the first quantum foundations experiment in space so we're looking forward to it that's great yep. uh, we open the talk up for questions please uh, uh, if you could uh, kindly use the raise hand feature and uh, i already have a few questions from the chat so uh, claudia are you there would you like to please Ask the question yourself. I can unmute you if you like. Yeah. Ah, okay. Claudio says he cannot use the uh, voice system. So I will read out his question. The first question uh, Can you distinguish gravitational entanglement from Casimir like effects? Yeah. I mean, that, that's, of course, a very good question. Um, and I mean, okay. So the first thing to say is that. Uh, we are not yet in in the position that we we have this kind of entanglement and we would need to answer and make sure that it is gravity so that is again you know some years down the line uh, I have un some noise it's always nice I have to mute Claudio yeah but, but then, okay, so um, um, the way to do it is that you, um, um, of course, you have you have an expectation you can calculate uh, what what like this the strengths of these different interactions is, and then you want to build your experiment in a configuration which is minimizing all the other effects which are not gravity, uh, and uh, that means that you have to shield uh, the two masses. That's a well-known uh, problem. Uh, in these two mass experiments, so people like Adelberger and Washington and so on, who do torsion balance experiments to to measure gravitational um, um, uh, two mass uh, effects, um, they 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 have uh, you know solutions which work in in some regimes, and um, so we are hoping in our configuration, so we have these uh, superconducting cups, and um, uh, so there will be like a superconducting wall between the particles, so they don't. Um, directly see each other if you want. So, um, and um, of course, we have to 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 measure this, and we have to uh, qu uh, quantify uh, uh, how true that statement is. But the hope would be that everything which is electromagnetic, and that it would include Casimir and Casimir Polder, and so on, that that is screened by by the superconductor um, yeah. as an interaction. Yes. Yeah. But of course, you can also. And I think there are now proposals you could equally use. Uh, you know, Casimir interaction to to entangle yeah. the two masses. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, more questions, please. I go to the next question from the chat. Gregory Trailing. In the seventies, there were these experiments that showed gravitationally induced quantum interference using neutrons, mm -hmm. uh, splitting them into two parts of different heights using silicon crystals, mm -hmm. and on experiments still a thing i haven't seen much about it since yeah yeah the, the, they're, they're still a thing as far as i know so there's hartmut abele in in vienna at the tu in vienna uh, and they of course use um, you know neutron sources in Chernobyl, which are uh, you know more coherent and intense but these experiments are still uh, ongoing um, and um, there, there are some papers now and then where they where they update and where they show new results that is actually something which would be interesting to, if, if possible, to do with larger masses. But then, as one can easily calculate the basically the um, you know in in the uh, in the potential the the, the quantum states the, the gravitational quantum states they become so close uh, to each other that it is difficult to um, you know to 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 make sure or to detect in an experiment now it is in the ground state and now it's in you know one of the higher states so. Uh, but with neutrons, I think, uh, as far as I know, they're, they're, they're uh, you know, still doing these experiments and improving them. Yes. Yeah. Any surprises expected there? And it's a classical gravitational field. 
which is like a force field which can sort of deflect the neutrons. So uh, it's like a gravitational version of stern garlock, something like that. I don't know. And why do we expect some? Any, what are we studying here with the neutrons? And um, it is, it's basically how, how an, a particle is affected by a gravitational potential. And it, in the end, it is Earth's gravity. And uh, you, they do it in, an, in a way that you introduce boundary conditions. And it is, I don't know if you know these quantum dots, which they use in uh, like, you know, for electromagnetic uh, radiation. Uh, so you basically confine uh, your quantum well, and then you get energy states. Um, and they, they do this actually with, uh, with, with or, or try to do this with gravitational fields. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure. Um, uh, again, I'm, I'm not an expert in gravity, of course. Um, what, what one would learn about gravity from this experiment, what it, what it means, actually, if you can do that. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. Okay, so thank, thank you. So Claudio has a comment on this same issue. Neutron experiments, bouncing them off a plate is something that has been done as well. That is putting them in the gravitational ground state above a plate. Hmm. So with a comment, there's a reference to one of the original experiments with neutrons yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, another reference. And uh, Gregory says, I remember wondering about the connection with the Ford Motor Company at the time. It was, just a, joke. It was just a joke. At the time, the Ford Motor Company was actually okay, sponsored. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. No, no, you can have jokes, no problem. If they are thinking about flying, ah, okay. And now, Vesselin has a question on the slide about torque detection. Why is the simulated PSD order of magnitude smaller than the experimental? Uh, this was one of, somewhere in the middle, I think. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, I was just I was just dozing off. Can you can you repeat the question? Uh, yeah. On the slide about torque detection. Yeah. Why is the simulated PSD order of magnitude smaller than the experimental? Ah, yeah. Okay, so that's actually that's very interesting. So the um, the experimental PSD, it's so nice. Maybe I can show it again. Um, Go ahead, please. Um, you can share it here. Yeah. Uh, I think it's this one. Yeah. Um, so there are two, two, two graphs, two PSDs. One is calculated here, and um, one is... Um, uh, is the experiment. So the top one is the experiment. And you see that this is like really nice. It has these sharp Lorentzian peaks and so. And the the lower one, as it says here, is the simulated one. And um, that is like an, um, a model which was done by Marco Toros um, and which includes basically um, uh, all the degrees of freedom of, of the system. So all the translation and all the rotations um, and is then simulating it. So um, and uh, with like the computational power where we had access to, it was only possible to do it with a certain resolution. And that now affects basically how precisely these, these features come out. So you see that, you know, for, for high, higher frequencies, they look fairly good, but for lower frequencies, you can see that um, the resolution is really uh, like uh, borderline. Um, for us, the most important message was that um, basically the, the frequency position, yeah, so basically where you see the precession motion and where you see the translation motions and where you see the rotations that they are basically agreeing between simulation and experiment so that basically means that when you put in a certain geometry of the particle yeah so um and the, the polarization of the light and the geometry of the trap that you then basically by uh, running the model you can reproduce the observed um, um the observed spectra that there's there's a very interesting point here. If I if I maybe can expand on this for like a minute, uh, yeah, if you allow me. Yeah, um, okay, yeah. So so now what what this actually means is that if you have uh, a particle of a given shape, yeah. So let's say it is like in like these dumbbells where you have two particles sitting together, they're glued together. Um, then actually the reason why we can drive rotation and see it is that. 
um, we have now a, a polariz polarizability tensor. Yeah? So the polarizability of the particle is not a scalar anymore, and it is it is different in each direction. It's a tensor. Yeah? And um, now when this thing is spinning, then um, it, the, the, these different polarizabilities, uh, these are like the, um, the, the particle properties which define how many photons are really scattered. Yeah? So the polarizability is the, is, is the, let's say the light matter interaction parameter, which defines how many photons uh, can I get back from the particle. So now that means that uh, 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 what I actually measure is, is I measure the, um, uh, like this tensor, uh, you know, property of the particle uh, when it rotates with, by, by the light, it scatters back, yeah. So now mm -hmm. the question was, can I actually use um, the spectrum? So the very spectrum, which you see here with all these features, which is like a fingerprint, can I use it to reconstruct the shape? Can I do a shape tomography by just measuring um, the X, Y, Z and the rotational motions of the particle? And what turns out, yes, you can. It's, uh, you know, um, Marco's model was like the key to do it. And um, so you, you can, um, um, show for like simple shapes that you can roughly approximate like the shape so so how it looks like and um, uh, it can be refined so in, in a way I don't know it's maybe an application which comes out of this research but um, based on on this work here Peter Barker I think last year he showed that, that you can do shape tomography by by just looking at these spectral features yeah. but yeah so back to my original question yeah. then should I can I think about this discrepancy as related to normalization of the volume of the shape? Because you said that you, you had actually uh, simulations that didn't allow you to go to a very fine, that means that yeah. maybe, yeah. Yes, exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. yeah. thanks. Thank you, thank you. So Henrik, while, while we are at the slides, could we go to the MON slide, please? Uh, it came on early on in the talk. This one? Yeah, this was this yeah. was very interesting. Could you please expand on this a bit? So, how are we testing Mond here? What is the proposal? Okay, so it, it it's very simple. So it is just saying uh, what we're actually doing when we do this two mass experiment is we measure acceleration. Yeah, so we measure acceleration very precisely. Um, in fact, what we have shown already is uh, we can you know on this probe particle, we can measure an acceleration of one times 10 to the minus 10, or here it is written the, the actual number, one times 10 to minus nine meter per second square, yeah? So if we, if we um, optimize the experiment, um, if we, you know, carefully choose the mass of this guy, and if we tune uh, the trap to tune uh, the resonance frequency in, in the right regime, and if we find a way to get the quality factor up a little bit, then we can, basically push down and that's what's shown here on the y axis of the plot that's acceleration so if we can basically just push the acceleration below 10 to minus 10 meters per second square then these mond models yeah even in a simple form they predict a deviation from uh, like the uh, newtonian um, you know gravity yeah and then there's deep mond and so on. It, it, you, you i guess you all know the mond story comes from astrophysics from this rotational curves and uh, you know it explains nicely um, the observation which, which which they have of of this rotation curves and galaxies um, uh, but it should be possible to do this on ground so i know there's a discussion that people say you cannot measure um, this acceleration on earth because there's always the moon which gives you a much larger acceleration than this you know 10 to minus 10 meters per second square but um, my, my uh, answer to this is that we do like a, a two mass experiment and from the perspective of earth and moon, these are so close together that whatever field these other bigger objects generate, um, it is basically the same. So both of these masses are affected in the same way by any other acceleration which comes from, from other external masses. And we are just looking at you know, the internal gravitational acceleration. And if we can do this at below 10 to minus 10 meters per second square, then we would see, um, you know, if there's a deviation or not. That, that's the idea. 
That's great. So what's the prospect for reaching 10 to the minus 10? Yeah, so um, so we think that what, what limits us at the moment is, is, is vibration. So basically external vibrations which which go into the into the setup. And you see here also in the sketches indicated that uh, you also have to vibrationally decouple the two traps from each other. Yeah. So you, you cannot have them sitting on, on the kind of same suspension system. So everything has to be isolated from the lab, but then also the two caps have to be isolated from each other. And um, so that is, is, is just, if you want an engineering challenge, uh, there are technical solutions and I have shown you the, uh, these gas filters from LIGO. Um, and we are, we are, we are basically uh, building those uh, at the moment. And then we hope that we achieve so low um, vibration levels that um, we, can, we can push down in, in the acceleration sensitivity. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. So my understanding is that if we get into the deep mon regime of accelerations, the force field is, will fall as one over R instead of one over R square. Uh, that's what I understand from Mon. So is that what you would be testing? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, so you're right. So in, 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 in the experiment, of course, it wouldn't be sufficient to just do like a single experiment where you measure, then you would basically in this graph, you get just one point. Yeah. What you would need to do is you would then need to vary the distance and then you would go basically along this axis or you would need to repeat this with different masses uh, and then you would go basically up um, the, the other axis. So you have to do a variation of your of your gravity experiment and then you can basically probe um, uh, this curve or this curve so whatever happens you can but you should be able to see the difference. Thank you. So another very interesting feature of the deep mon regime is that the force field is proportional not to the mass of the source, but to the square root of the mass of the source. Okay. Is there something promising uh, how it's testing the scaling with mass in the deep mon regime? Uh, would that be easier than testing the distance dependent? How, or can we use both of these uh, aspects? One yeah, yeah, you, can, you, can, you can use both of them, yeah. Um, of course, if you uh, what you also have to do, I, I haven't basically mentioned this, but but you have to know the the mass, and that is typically actually the biggest problem in 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 these type of experiments is that you have to characterize the mass of the two masses which you have like uh, really to to an uh, uh, you know to to the extent of whatever precision you want to reach, yeah? and and that's not so easy. Yeah? So um, that's why many people think that that is something for atoms because they are nature has done these kind of uh, calibration for you. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Doing a MON experiment with atoms, uh, say, for example, that kind of uh, uh, thing. Yeah. Mm. I'll just go back and look at the chat. I think there was something more. Uh, so if I miss something out, please point it out to me. Uh, then there's a question from Bernd. Could one test for torsion or spin gravity couplings in general using the neutron experiments. Uh, okay, uh, I think that's what being asked is if gravity and tors torsion are both present. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. That is like, an, what, I, I have no, yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> okay, no problem. We'll go yeah. on. Yeah. Oh, okay, I, if I missed something out, please let me know. Mm. Now, back to- uh, Just because I see Roger there. Hi, hi Roger, good to see you. <laughs> mm. Yeah, yeah, nice to see you. And uh, so, okay, so yeah, there's a question. Bernd, uh, please go ahead. I have a question concerning your amount experiment because you uh, said, one can can ignore the moon. Uh, mm. Have you contacted uh, the theorists working on Mont because they are all very careful uh, mm. when they discuss gravitational field superimposed from 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 two different sources. They have the so-called external field effect and yeah. stuff like this. So you should be. I don't know. Uh, it has to have been taken into account by uh, for your experiments, or will this be taken into account for the data analysis and setting yeah, up yeah. the experiment? It, it it will be taken into account. Yes, yeah. I mean, 
we, we know about it. We haven't spoken to them yet, but uh, it's on our radar. Yeah. So, you okay, know, when, the time, when the time is right, when we actually have some data, we, we will get in touch with them for sure. Yes, okay, good. Opportunity to mention you, some of you might have seen this exciting new paper on the Astrophysical Journal mm -hmm. a few years back, uh, showing that uh, if we have wide binary star systems, uh, in the observed acceleration, uh, centripetal acceleration is below the MON critical value and actually agrees with MON rather than Newton. This is shown with using tens of thousands of uh, wide binary systems from this Gaia satellite data. It seems like a very clean uh, paper and if it survives, it might be in league with the anomalous precession of mercury, which, you know, supported GR. So maybe we will wait and watch. This looks like a very interesting Develop. Maybe someone else has also seen it and they want to say something about it. Ah, I would have something uh, to spoil yeah. the party. There's another paper where they claim <laughs> that they have observed a very massive galaxy, so a relic galaxy, so a very old a galaxy which uh, basically formed all of its star very close uh, after uh, very close to the Big Bang. Uh, it's within a galactic cluster, and it's a, a galaxy as massive as our Milky Way, and they claim that they don't see. Uh, any deviation from Newton's law, so also any from the deviations you normally would associate with dark matter. So you have a massive galaxy without dark matter, and this they say, okay, that's not bad for dark matter because maybe all the dark matter has been stripped from this galaxy, but this is bad for more because if you have a Milky Way like galaxy for when it comes to the mass and you, you don't see any deviation from Newton's law, this, uh, yeah, somehow bad for more. So this is also right. something which we kept in mind. I don't know whether this will hold up. Uh, I mean, the galaxy has a little bit has a, has an astro in a notorious history uh, for <laughs> producing uh, results, which then have to be uh, changed. So originally, I thought that it would be a, it had a very very massive black hole, and another group said no, it doesn't have any black hole. And at the end, they uh, concluded it has a normal black hole. So maybe I don't know whether this, these results will hold up, but I, I just want to mention them to spoil. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Very exciting. Yes. So Henrik, I had a couple of uh, questions. Uh, one is uh, uh, a very direct test of wave function collapse would be uh, a slow motion replay of what happens when a quantum system meets a measuring apparatus. So the collapse of the wave function is not instantaneous. It lasts for some duration. And if I could you know, see the some gentle fall off uh, in a slow motion, and how feasible or difficult or challenging is such a test today? Um, okay, so that, that would be like, uh, you know, directly testing it with superpositions. And um, yeah, I, I don't know, it's hard to say. I mean, we, we are working and, you know, you, you know that there are many other groups also to, to try to, to do like meaningful experiments or, you know, to, to take large masses and put them in superpositions. And th there are ideas for these nanoparticles, but equally, you know, there, there are ideas now how to do it with, with you know, BECs, with atomic systems. And um, th these are very uh, well controlled uh, systems, these atomic systems. So I don't know, may maybe there you could also then, I, I think, okay, so the first step would be to, to, to see the effect, yeah, to see that. At, at some point, I don't know, there, there is some kind of decoherence which you cannot explain. It shouldn't be there because you have done all the other things like background gas pressure and temperature and so to, to turn off um, like the environmental decoherence effects and then still uh, it disappears. And then of course you would need to study this uh, in, in more detail and uh, to, to look at the transients, uh, as you say, make it like a movie of how it happens. That would be maybe one of them or you could, you know, vary the mass, or you could, uh, you know, try to play with with the parameters where you have access in the experiment to to understand closer and 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 then try to identify what the process actually is, which is, you know, um, collapsing the wave function. Yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you. And uh, I, 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 I couldn't give you a time scale or something. Okay, like that. and that's, this still <laughs> remains very challenging. Yeah. 
very desirable and very challenging. Yes. Okay. The other question was, what is your current take on collapse models? Uh, I heard from Angelo a couple of weeks <laughs> to know your thoughts. You've been doing the experiments. We have not ruled them out yet, have we? No. Uh, I, I mean, I, I ruled out, I, I wouldn't say. I, I, like, um, I like collapse models. Uh, I like the idea. Um, I, I, I fundamentally like the idea that there's more and that uh, there's like a qualitative change in in physics and there's something new to discover, right? And there's something which which goes beyond quantum mechanics. I think that's maybe the most important thing. Um, uh, I, I don't know. It could be that, you know, collapse models as they're written down is, is not exactly the right idea. Um, it could be that, um, you know, it, it's narrowed down now a little bit by experiments. But I think the, the the basic problem is not solved, right? The measurement problem is not solved. So uh, I, I think we, we can relax and we, you know, there's yes. great things to be done in the future. <laughs> I was talking to Angelo during his talk. So even if the bounds are very strong right now, that's for white noise. It might be telling us that uh, uh, if you do the, if the no, if a non-white colored noise is a source, for the collapse, yeah. you might still detect colorful collapse models. Yeah, I, I mean, I think a very interesting question is beyond like these mathematical models is what what's the physics, right? What's the physics process? And I think there, there is maybe an, a better lead also for, for future experiments. And I mean, I think it's a good expectation that it should have something to do with gravity. And um, so, you know, I, I would I would look in this direction, and I would um, you know try to, as 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 Roger always does. Yeah, you look at problems from different sides, and you turn them upside down, and then you know something comes out. I, I think you know I would be, I would try to be really playful with these things. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> More questions, please. Yeah. So I also wanted to bring back something that we talked to uh, like about a year ago or so. Uh, that is tests of uh, this bell, bell inequality in the CHS, CHS, CHSH form and looking for the violation of the serials and bound. Namely quantum theory says the correlations can only be so this much strong, but uh, causality, special relativity allows the correlations to be stronger. There yeah. is a gap between quantum theory and relativity. To me, it seems that's the most promising place to look for a departure from quantum theory. There's no good reason why the serials and bounds should not be violated, but I see that it doesn't excite experimentalists who are doing bell tests. I, I, I have written to a couple of people, but they have nothing to say. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, how to get them interested in, yeah. you know. Maybe, yeah, no, I, I think it did. Um, I, you say it's a year ago, yeah, that we that we talked about it or because I don't, I don't recall the details, but in, in yeah. general, I think uh, there, there's sorry, always like. Yeah, one moment. So, sorry to interrupt, just to give the background. So with the student, we were testing. Uh, so trace dynamics has a limiting case uh, yeah. quantum theory. But uh, trace dynamics is more general, Steve's trace dynamics is more general than quantum theory. And there are regimes in which it departs mm -hmm. from quantum. In those regimes, we showed that trace dynamics violates the serials in bound. Mm -hmm. And so we have a direct example of a theory which disagrees with quantum theory in some regime. And mm -hmm. in that regime, it's also have giving rise to correlations stronger than quantum theory. And we would like to test these. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, okay, so it, it, what, what I wanted to say without um, now being able to like from now of then quickly going into the physics of this, I, I think there's like one important step which which is always important and that is like, um, you know, how, how would an experiment look like which could test this? Yeah. So what is what is like the best experiment to look into this physics? Do you have an answer to that question? So I've 
we have to do a bell experiment and our guess seems to be that it has to be done at high energies in the particle physics LHCs. Okay. Mm -hmm. I did a bell experiment with two with a correlated pair of particles which had a central mass of energy, let's say around the TV. Hmm. And then Alice and Bob measured the correlations. We expect a departure from quantum mechanics there. So, but you yeah, the last time you told me that a Bell experiment at such high energies is very challenging. Yes, yeah. I I I have I have that, that I mean I, I'm not an expert in this field and I don't I don't know. Um so yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think I've probably asked you most of the things I wanted to uh, ask. So I will be happy to have more questions uh, from the view viewers. Uh, so the, yeah. So one other thing which came up recently is the particle physicists are getting interested in tabletop experiments to test the standard model. Mm -hmm. uh, at low energies, not TV, LHC, but at lower energies. Things yeah. like the electric dipole moment of the electron. Mm -hmm. So you have, have you had a chance by to talk to particle physicists because your kind of setup, but their kind of questions. Mm -hmm. Testing particle physics using your uh, machinery. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there, 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 there's some... Uh... You know, there, there, there's some development. So there is the, these experiments which you mentioned, but they're going on for already quite some time, I, at least two decades, I would say. And so what you what you do there is basically advanced spectroscopy of, of certain, you know, materials and molecules, and then uh, you you try to, um, you know, you know, see if there is uh, like an, a dipole moment there, or you know, these EDM experiments and. They're super challenging and uh, improving. Um, you know, every five years they have a new result, but so far everything is is like uh, you know zero. Yeah, so there's no deviation from from the expected, yeah. as far as I know. But uh, I mean, they're they're going and they're exceptional experimentalists and they're fantastic experiments. So um, it, it's 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 very good to see that this is actually happening. As you say, tabletop experiments for uh, you know particle physics questions. Yeah. Um, um, the other thing which is happening is that, you know, with, with quantum technologies, uh, that, um, you know, particle physicists uh, seem to be interested in having a look if these new detectors, these new quantum, these new quantum technology detectors can be actually used for, for like classic, um, you know, particle physics question and huge is of course dark matter. So, you know, can, can you have, uh, uh more compact, uh, more diverse dark matter detectors, which can look in different, uh, you know, regimes for, you know, predicted candidates of dark matter or even non-predicted candidates of dark matter. Um, so, so, so that is that is quite uh, active. So I know that a lot of funding goes in this direction at the moment in the UK, but also outside. Um, and then I think also with. Um, you know, quantum computation and uh, together with AI, so like data analysis, basically. Yeah? So um, that there's also interest from, from particle physicists to, to use these kind of new computation techniques to um, to analyze data and to have a look into the... Okay, thanks. Yeah. So they're, they're kicking me out of here. So I have like maybe two minutes left or so. Yeah. Okay, so okay, that's good. I think uh, we're probably done with yeah. the question. So I still uh, invite any more questions. Hi, yeah, Ashutosh, please go ahead. Quick comment on your previous comment, Ajinder. So at the LHC, there is one clean system where Higgs, which is very narrow, decays to two Z bosons. So you have a presumably a spin zero state decaying to two spin one. And so clearly they have to be entangled, the two Zs. Mm -hmm. and it's a coherence lens issue because I don't know if this is a good position situation or not, because the Z boson decays very quickly. So the idea is to look at the polarization of the Z through the decay into leptons, to electron leptons. Yeah. And you watch the correlation of the one Z with the other. So at the moment, the statistics are low enough that this is only assuming 
entanglement standard model and everything, you're just trying to establish the CP properties of the Higgs. Mm -hmm. Now, could it go beyond that? I mean, so CP is binary, right? So you should be able to eliminate spin, uh, other CP hypotheses. And once you have a particular CP established, maybe with enough statistics, you could see that the correlation between the two leptons this way and the two leptons that way is not exactly, you know, maybe a small deviation from the pattern, the angular distribution shows up. This is the only clean system I can think of, which mm -hmm. you know everything. Uh, so that's so, why whether the entanglement gives you the exact right amount of correlation or there's a small difference. So you're saying this would fall in Henrik's domain to do uh, an entanglement test experiment, but it would have to be something coupled with a place where you can have Higgs decays, no? Yeah. <laughs> so to me, yeah. to me, it actually sounded like it would be interesting for you, TP, to have a look into your entanglement idea in high energy. Yeah, I think yeah, that, uh, <laughs> yes. that uh, Akshitosh already asked me some interesting things like if you have a second Higgs, what are its decay modes? Mm. So, like, to be less theoretical and actually come out and say measurables, which are what are yeah. the actual variables? Yeah, so may, maybe, uh, yeah, <laughs> something like that. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so just one more thing you could try to compute. If the angular yeah. coefficients yeah. between the two Z bosons are one at one TV or 100 GV, 1% 1 off from. Yeah. Yes. From exact um, prediction of CP. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. I, I have to go now. Um, okay. Thanks, Henrik. Thanks very much uh, uh, for a very exciting talk. So thanks everybody for coming. So we see you in one first September for Tavian Ray's lecture. We have holidays in August from our Osmo talk. So hope it will not be a very hot August. Less hot yes, than yeah. July. So take care. Bye-bye. Okay, See you. you. Bye-bye. For the weather. Bye. So if there's, uh, Henrik had to go. So if there's still any discussion to be done, we are always available because we like to hang on for some time. If someone wants to stay back, uh, the recording is still available for another 15, 20 minutes. Or, but if you want to close it up, that's also fine. So I would just uh, say that you should keep an eye on this galaxy, what's going on with. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so this is the, the reference you sent, uh, Burnt. But it's one galaxy, is it? But uh, oh, there are many galaxies of this weird kind. Uh, no, so far, uh, there are a few galaxies, uh, very small so dwarf galaxies where they have observed mm -hmm. some peculiar cases where either the galaxy is devoid of dark matter or the galaxy is just made of dark matter. There are only a few stars which somehow uh, are not dispersed into the intergalactic medium, but they uh, seem to be in a 95 or 97 percent dark matter. And there are other dwarf galaxies where there is no dark matter. But this is the first time people claim to have, have observed a, a massive galaxy, so the mass of the Milky Way, which does not show any dark matter. And okay. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I, I don't have expertise on these uh, astrophysical aspects. So what uh, with some colleagues we are trying to look at actually is a, a theoretical, possible theoretical origin for MOND, which is generalizable to the relativistic uh, setting. Uh, so it, it seems that whatever relativistic MOND will be, will be somewhat distinct from MOND itself, just as electromagnetism is distinct from its Coulomb limit, the vector potential okay. of the overall strength of the electromagnetic field. This is exciting because, and I hope that the measurements of the uh, massive black hole in this uh, special galaxy are correct. Otherwise, I'm just telling nonsense at, at the moment. But uh, this galaxy is also peculiar because it has a very massive black hole in the center. So it mm -hmm. has a very, uh, so to speak, relativistic center. So the, I think the, the mass of the black hole in, in this galaxy is uh, uh, 1,000 times as 
massive as the uh, black hole in, in our Milky Way, so at the center of our Milky Way. So mm -hmm. this is uh, something where this uh, galaxy is different from, from the Milky Way. And the other thing is it's uh, basically it's devoid of anything but black holes and stars. It doesn't have uh, it doesn't have much dust. It doesn't have many gas. It, so it does not form stars. So it's a called a wet and dead galaxy. So if these measurements are correct, it's just one massive black hole with a lot of stars around without any dark matter and non-processed baryonic matter, so to speak. So everything is in stars and and a massive black hole. And uh, so and it doesn't have anything else. So no free hydrogen gas, no dust, and no dark matter. You say it disagrees with Mond. Uh, the accelerations uh, are uh, explained. Uh, they are in the deep Mond regime. Small acceleration, but consistent with Newtonian gravity. That's what you are suggesting, no? I, I, we have to uh, look closer into the paper. I think they looked at the outskirts of the galaxy, so where uh, the acceleration should be in the Mond regime, and they didn't uh, find any deviation from Newton's law. So it's really uh, hard to explain with Mond, and it's a little bit difficult to explain also with dark matter because normally you would expect dark matter is needed to uh, well prevent but such a galaxy from flying apart. It's non-Keplerian, all right, but it's also non-Mondian and uh, non-dark matter. Yeah, it's, as I said, it's strange. So I just wanted to uh, point yeah. out uh, it's something to, to, to think about that I've learned about this one week ago and I'm still thinking about it. So I cannot give any good answers. I just wanted to let you know and maybe somebody finds out. If it's not a measurement error, we had some examples where peculiar galaxies turned out to be not in peculiar after all because people made some mistake in the data analysis and then if you've done it correctly then all of a sudden the dark matter comes back so we have to wait and see what the rest of the community especially the demand uh, followers uh, from the experimental side have to say about this galaxy but at the moment it's, it's really strange it's just yes. uh, an incredible it's, outlier so it seems to me after seeing this white binaries paper there are two three papers this might turn out to be a very clean system to test if there are departures from Newtonian gravitation um, because it's, uh, there's no scope for dark matter. It should be Newtonian, but if it is showing deviations, then that would be very clean, actually. And the situation will become puzzling if both papers are confirmed. So if nobody from the dark matter camp finds any mistakes in the white binary paper and nobody from the Mond camp and, uh, and the scientific community in general does not find any mistakes in the uh, massive galaxy paper, then we have two <laughs> contradictory results and we have to... But there's one difference. This is one galaxy. Those are 20,000 stars Gaia from the Gaia data for which this okay uh, okay so measurement your data happened. set is much larger than this than mine yeah that's true <laughs> not mine not mine the guy data. yeah i mean uh, i'm just uh from from the uh people looking at the white binaries and uh, compared to just one galaxy we have very good and a large data set of course it's not our data sorry i mean uh, i was just uh for, for the argument so yes 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 uh, yes yes so I think in the years to come, that seems like a very clean system to study, which uh, will probably settle the issue. Yeah, um, I would agree. Yeah. Okay, so. Oh, can uh, I have only one yeah, please go question? Ahead. What will uh, TV and Ray talk about in September? Uh, it would be something to do with, I think, E8 and octonions, but I don't know the precise title. I okay, don't have it's, uh, it's okay if I just so add some. Octonions, E8, and perhaps connection to the standard model okay. uh, in, in that ballpark. Okay. Oh, by the way, I can switch on my video again. Sorry. Yeah. Ashutosh, today I saw a paper by... K.S. Babu, Mohapatra, and one more author. You, I'm sure you know these people on left-right symmetric uh, models uh, as a possible explanation for the strong CP problem. 
as an alternative to the axion. So they also have a Higgs doublet, uh, two, two, two Higgs doublets. And uh, so the, that was actually a paper quite similar to what we have been suggesting that uh, in a left-right symmetry model, you don't need the axion to uh, explain why strong force doesn't violate uh, uh, parity. And uh, uh, what, what would make such an idea testable? They had some prediction for neutrino masses and some they had extra what they call uh, gauge singlet, three for new fermions that are gauge singlets. I don't understand that too well. But how, how popular are these left-right symmetric models in the particle physics community? Do you have some idea? So I have used them. I mean, they are consistently being tested for the most striking of the predictions, which is in addition to the two doublets you say, there is a triplet. Yes, yes. And then after electroweak symmetry breaking, one of the triplets becomes doubly charged. Yes, yes, I have seen that model, yes. So this I have also published, other people are publishing now. The limits are going higher and higher. So the nice thing about doubly charged is it decays to same sign leptons or same sign Ws. So same sign is a very nice thing because opposite sign dileptons is a very common thing with top anti-top background at the LHC. Mm -hmm. So. So you want sources of same sign, which kills a lot of background. And the doubly charged Higgs is probably the single best example I've ever come across. Mm -hmm. So that aspect is far more unique. The doubly charged Higgs is far more unique in terms of experimental signature than second Higgs or anything like this. You can imagine the obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. So I've done those searches, people are still doing them. Uh, I think the limits are now at 400 GV plus. Mm -hmm. But of course, all limits are based on some coupling. So you have to have some cross section. Mm -hmm. These cross sections tend to be rather reliable. Uh, hopefully there aren't any cancellations because you can always get the Drellian mechanism. Once you know mm -hmm. the electric charge, the Drellian mechanism is completely unambiguous. Mm -hmm. So unless the gauge numbers are somehow canceling and the cross section is smaller than you think, mm -hmm. you just go by the Drellian cross section, there is no room for missing it. Uh, once you know the cross section, once you try a particular mass, it's either there or not, there is no parameter space. But if the cross section could be somehow suppressed, then as you know, all bets are off. Mm -hmm. So the, that the, one is, is, I have not seen a left-right model that doesn't produce a triplet. Maybe there is a way to suppress the triplet. I thought the one we have, I should go back and see my paper. I don't recall a triplet. But the other remark I wanted to make in this left-right symmetric models, uh, when people introduce a SU2R, sometimes it will be cross U1 B minus L because it is this combination which is anomaly free. So for us, we have a SU2R cross a U1, but that is a very different interpretation. It is a precursor of general relativity and MON. The U1 actually we are trying to understand as origin for MON gravity. And the SU2R is a precursor of general relativity. And this is not really a Planck scale phenomenon. It will give GR even at low energies, even though the GR gravity will be very weak compared to the standard model forces, but it can be incorporated in the unification even at low energies. So somehow this message is not going across to particle physicists who always think that gravity comes at the Planck scale, 10 to the 19 GeV. But in our theory, the Planck scale is reset to the electroweak symmetry breaking scale. So the left-right symmetric extension models are actually unification models with gravity. 
And it is very hard to convince particle physicists that that is a possibility. So for them, SU2R is a new uh, heavy X bosons and uh, things new. They, they will have new heavy bosons. And uh, so I just wanted to share this thought yeah. with you that uh, I don't know how to bring about this, overcome this communication gap that the <laughs> SQR in the left right model can be just our familiar gravitation. Well, you know, the sociology of the field, the model building part has steadily shrunk, my opinion, in the in, in some sense, being taken over by string theory. So yeah, the dominant sociology is the string theory sociology. And even traditional model builders, since there isn't that much data with anomalies coming out, mm -hmm. the traditional model builders are going different ways. Mm -hmm. A lot of them have switched to dark matter and things like this. Mm -hmm. So... And the experimentalists are always looking for signatures. Yeah, like you said last time, yes. yes. Yeah. Now, I don't know how many experimentalists are There's enough string theorists to listen to each other. So, <laughs> so they talk to each other and experimentalists are looking for, in some sense, somebody else to talk to. So you don't think string theory is phenomenology is dead yet? I mean, they just for me it's very, very, very boring. Uh, there is a new yeah, I don't know what to think about string theory. Uh, so there, there is a remark, Gregory Trailing. I prefer this idea where the structure of the Higgs doublet precludes all but the U and R part. The rest of the R part interferes and mixes the H and HC. HC are probably the charged Higgs, which is one field since the Higgs is its own antiparticle. Sorry, I was trying to type on my phone. And it's supposed to say field. I got big fingers. Well, this is that paper I had 20 years ago, you know, showing where the structure was coming from. And in those sort of models, you can't have the right one because... Um, you've got the Higgs and its conjugate field, which which are the same thing because there's it's a scalar. There's one Higgs field. It's just expressed two different ways. They're the same field components. And if you try to bring in the right-handed part, it it scrambles that and it mixes it up so it doesn't work. I mean, this mm -hmm. this is the you've seen this paper. You've referenced it. Um, mm -hmm. that's, I, I like that about it because it's nice and tight and it's it agrees with the existing standard model. And, mm -hmm. and I, I I can post the paper here. Other so you, you don't have a second Higgs, you are saying? Um, no, um, but when the, the there's problems with that original paper, there are many problems. And one of the things that has to get fixed does bring in an E8 and an E9, and that gives um, one more field that can be in there. So that could be a, a second Higgs, but it's not it's nothing like the other Higgs. It doesn't mix with it, and it doesn't. It's like a separate one that would somehow work into the three generations, giving them different masses. I mean, if I mean, you've seen this paper, but if others haven't, I can put it up. Yeah, I remember now. Yes, thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah that's the one that sat there for like 20 years and nobody referenced it. And now suddenly it's getting all these citations. That's a, a good precursor to what's happening with the octonions and CL6 and C, CL7, yeah, right? Sort of the same dimension, you know, CL7 is roughly that, but again, that's a little too small. It needs to be larger for... Um... You foresaw quite a few things. You are, you are right, for many years, it was not being referred, and now suddenly it's it's back. Yeah, the the boy model, um, how you could use these, um, you know, larger dimensional algebra, just put the gauge symmetries in the same sort of format as the, the Lorentz symmetries, at least the rotational ones. I agree. I agree. So, yeah. So, Ashutosh, as an outside theorist, my impression is a lot of people are saying there will be a second Higgs. So, the experimental community also takes that possibility quite seriously. Uh, Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Second Higgs is a very common phenomena to search for mm -hmm. in different ways. You can look okay. for vector boson scattering not being fully unitarized by the one Higgs. You can look for direct production of a second Higgs. You can try to see whether the mixing of the second Higgs with the first Higgs changes the properties of the first Higgs. Every one of those things is being pursued. Okay, the so the so-called Higgs factory. This would be one of the things to uh, look for. Yeah, what we call this Higgs factory ex experiments. And... Yes. So the the Higgs factory experiment is primarily designed for that third option. That precise measurements of the given Higgs deviate from standard model, perhaps due to mixing with some other Higgs. Mm -hmm. Now, if that other Higgs is light, maybe it shows up in the decay of the first Higgs. If it's heavier, then it will only influence the properties of the Higgs we have, the mm -hmm. change the branching ratio or something like this. Uh, but the energy of the Higgs factory may never reach the mass of the second scalar. And so what, is there some ballpark bounds on the mass of the second Higgs? To... So assuming the second Higgs, it at least mixes. So now it depends on the quantum numbers you assign to the second Higgs. Mm -hmm. If you assign no quantum number, so if it's sterile, then it can only be produced through mixing with the standard model Higgs. Okay. So that's one set of, and then it starts to depend on how much the mixing is. If you turn the mixing off, the bounds get weaker, you turn the mixing high. It's a complicated question because if you turn the mixing high, then the standard model Higgs itself would start showing deviations of its properties. And so those do have some bounds. So you can't get the mixing to be too large. If you turn the mixing down, then the rate of which at which the second Higgs shows up gets suppressed. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a complicated n-dimensional plot that shows, but hundreds of GV is being probed. Okay. And if you take some special case, I think we're getting up to 600 GV. Mm -hmm. But if you take, we can always find some knob that makes the other Higgs become less visible. And so it's always, you know, what you have to specify a couple of other things at least to say what okay. to mean that bound. So, but hundreds of GV is in the right ballpark, roughly. Would it be lighter than the standard model Higgs? Now that's the other thing which is being pursued. I have one analysis in that. 10 GV, 5 GV, all this business is possible. Okay. <laughs> And that's yes. where the LHC can probably produce copious numbers, but it's all in the QCD muck. So the, the proton proton pileup is hiding all kinds of junk. Mm -hmm. so then you're looking for this thing to show up in a couple of taus or a couple of B quarks, mm -hmm. if it's Higgs like. So in the case of the heaviest thing it can. Mm -hmm. So two B quarks at 10 GV each has such a huge QCD background. Mm -hmm. So there are things that the LHC environment uh, could hide because it's mm -hmm. obviously a PP collider at, at high pileup. So, so the search and how to trigger on these things is not easy. Okay. So it could hide down there. Now that's where the Higgs factory will blossom because if the 125 GV Higgs can somehow decay down or do something to a 10 GV second scalar, since you'll make a million of these Higgses, as long as the branching ratio is not 10 to the minus six, mm -hmm. then that Higgs factory would be the way for a second light scalar to show up. Okay. It might, it might be better than the LHC for that. Mm -hmm. But the heavy Higgs, heavy second Higgs, I think the LHC will beat anything else. Okay. So this so-called Higgs factory, my ignorance, is it a 
new CERN experiment it will be, or is it somewhere else? Oh, okay. Still open. Still open. That's a politically charged question. So CERN would like to say that it can be done at CERN and nowhere else. Oh, okay. Now the Chinese will say, if the international community got interested, we can do it right away. Mm -hmm. Because digging a 100 kilometer tunnel is apparently cheaper in China and they have the ambition. Okay. For CERN, the main issue is who is going to pay for a $6 billion tunnel. Mm -hmm. Then you can start asking, what about the Japanese linear collider? Apparently, the international community is not giving Japan enough support. So that's difficult politics there. Mm -hmm. And if this goes on, debated long enough, maybe the US will come back into the game. Okay. So mm -hmm. let's wait and see. So this we are talking of a couple of decades time scale at least. Yeah. Okay. Yes, a couple of decades time scale at least. Uh, mostly there is some time needed for R and D some time needed for the power consumption, the electrical power consumption for the synchrotron radiation, mm -hmm. constantly radiating electrical power. So you have to, so the environmental impact and all of this and exactly how would you supply that much power and how would it be green energy, which is an important issue now. Mm -hmm. So some of it is politics, some of it is just consciousness related to climate change, just the yeah. power consumption. Mm -hmm. I would say those are, in fact, a little more important now than the politics is difficult. Yes, yes, I, I, I agree. I respect that. Yes, I think the priorities might be changing fairly, fairly strongly. That's true. It all depends on how you count. I mean, that's a long discussion. If you take ten billion dollars, divide by ten thousand people for thirty years. What's the what's the cost per scientist per year? How does that stack up against any other field versus the potential scientific return? Absolutely. I think mm -hmm. if one does that calculation fairly, it actually I think is a good deal as compared to other places where there is a lot of money, but it's scattered in so many small places that it doesn't become visible. The one other remark I wanted to make was this gulf between particle physics, both theorists and experimentalists, and the quantum foundation people like the work Henrik does to test quantum mechanics for large systems. Somehow these two communities, I don't think they really talk to each other much. The, some of our impression is the particle physics community believes there is nothing to be done about testing for departures from quantum theory. Um, it doesn't interest them. They think it is not relevant to particle physics. I have some differences with that uh, outlook. I think you are perhaps listening to only very few particle physicists and most particle physicists won't actually agree with that assessment. Ah, oh, okay. I, I you say listening to the Indian subject, for instance. You may be listening, what shall I say? You may be listening to some small biased community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You think more, I, more think, I don't think that represents the typical understanding of physicists. They are open to the idea of uh, quantum theory being approximate. Absolutely. Ah, okay. okay. Or, or that Einstein gravity is approximate. Yes, 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 yes. The second oh. one, I find them more open to, but questioning the exactness of quantum theory. So I'm not talking about the measurement problem. That, you know, sort of, People get bored and upset, you know, this measurement. That's all, no. Talk about the quantum to classical transition. Does quantum mechanics break down for large systems? If you entangle a million particles, uh, do they 
uh, does the entangled system still obey the Schrodinger equation or uh, not? This is an experimental question, uh, which perhaps might have a bearing on everything, including particle physics and unification, although it may not seem so, but... Uh, my, my reading of the psychology of a typical experimentalist, like I said earlier, is they translate what is being questioned into what techniques do I know that I can apply to that problem? So most what you're calling particle physicists are in the business of detecting and measuring as well as you can high energy particles. Yes. So the bulk of them are saying the techniques I know to measure high energy particles well, and I'm trying to make those techniques more precise or cheaper or something like this faster. Do they lend themselves to checking quantum mechanics as the right set of axioms? As most will say, no, my techniques are not useful for that kind of test. Yeah, that probably is correct because we like say want to test the superposition principle and uh, you don't create interference ex there, so. Right. Exactly, they're not creating interference in the bulk of particle physics experiments. We, we have so this it's not they, they will not. It's not that they're not interested, they're thinking, can I do something about it? And most of them will say, no, I'm not trained for that. So, ah, yeah. Yeah. Please no, go uh, ahead. I would have a question, if it's possible, because I will have to leave soon. Uh, yeah. How do particle physicists then deal with the quantum to classical transition or in quantum field theory? After all, they also measure some tracks in their uh, measurement devices and they should be interested in finding out how these tracks come about. Yes. So yes. So, let me think a little bit. It is mostly assigned to the process of color confinement, right? So all these pions and kaons, all the strongly interacting particles, mm -hmm. which are originally coming from quarks and gluons, presumably, mm -hmm. <laughs> presumably they're coming from quarks and gluons. And eventually confinement kicks in and they all become sort of confined set of classical particles. Okay. Uh, uh, we are just assuming the long distance physics eventually becomes classical. Due to confinement, actually. Confinement will at least make them color neutral. Okay. So they become free of the strong gauge interaction. Mm -hmm. And then at some point between 10 to the minus 24 seconds, which is when this happens, and five seconds, which is the time of flight for the particle to reach your eventual detector. Somewhere in there, the transition happens. Okay, at least then we have a time scale to look for between these two time, time scales, something should right. happen. There's a 10 to the 24, 24 orders of magnitude in the middle, and none of our detectors can ever get anywhere into that time scale. Okay, this is problematic. I, I admit it. It's, it's... So we, we are stuck at the seconds. Even speed of light gives us seconds at okay. which the sensors are placed. And a second is so far away from where the quantum mechanics is happening. And there's no way to get anywhere closer by, you know, maybe we can try a factor of 10 or something, but 10 to the 24 is too, too, too far away. So, okay. Uh, thank you very much also for, uh, for the nice discussion. And I have to leave now. Bye. Okay. Uh, you, have, you have to leave, Bernd? Or he's, it's Gregory, you are saying something? Well, I was just mentioning uh, we have this expression in the West, um, shut up and calculate, because yes. the, the quantum field theory works so well for any cross sections or scattering experiments we do in particle physics that we're not, I mean, I spent most of my early years as a grad student doing all these calculations at KEK, 
for chaotic hydrogen stuff. And yes, I was sitting and thinking about the foundational quantum mechanics of it, but I couldn't get anywhere. So it's not that the particle physicists don't think about these things. It's just, I can't think of anything beyond the, the quantum field theory that, that works. I mean, mm -hmm. maybe okay. it's just something, but I do think about these things. I just can't get anywhere. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So, you know, on that point of shut up and calculate, we have a joke here that the professor tells the student who's asking foundational questions, the professor says, shut up and calculate. The student says there is nothing left to calculate. And the professor says in that case, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. I mean, it's, so, it's a good rule, right? Yeah, but you no, know, so my, my, my outside. It's hard about finding an observable that one can calculate, even approximately. Yes. It takes a I, lot of thought to think of an observable that one can calculate, yeah. which, which I, never stops the string theorists. I must say, the string theorists are never bothered by that. Yeah. And many experimentalists will also say, well, it's been some time now. Can you give us some predictions? Yes. Um, and built into that was supersymmetry. So that was partly why so many experimentalists looked at the math and say, yeah, we have, whether I believe or not doesn't matter, but at least I have some observables I can chase. Yes. And I can build a uh, an experiment that is sensitive to those observables. Yes. So there's a corresponding logic for experimentalists where they shut up and build. Yes. Okay. Yes. Go build something that can detect that observable. And as soon as you find something you can build for, like we heard today's talk, you start building it. Absolutely. Yes. Then yeah. see how well it can do. There's no, no. Yeah, the please go. The string theorists lately have been pushing the idea that they don't need supersymmetry anymore. And, you know, I, yeah. I went through string theory stuff when I was in graduate school and studied it a little bit, and I thought it was necessary, and I don't understand how they're now doing string theory without supersymmetry. And it seems to be they're just avoiding experiment. They're trying to duck and dodge. I think so, too. Apparently, it's a lot more involved without supersymmetry. It just gets worse and worse. And I, I've never been of it i've never it's it just smells wrong to me i don't know what it is but yeah i think it, like i heard this recent talk of ed Witten, uh, given at the ictp what every physicist should know about string theory he only presented it as a uv complete theory of quantum gravity he did not say anything about particle physics and he said that he thinks compactification is the wrong way of trying to get from unification to the standard model. It won't mm -hmm. work, sort of what he said. So uh, that looked like a con con confession or a concession that supersymmetry is not the way to unify interactions. He, he didn't talk about supersymmetry at all, nor about uh, ADS-CFT. Uh, he only talked about the quantum gravity part of the string theory, and he said, the rest, we don't know how to proceed. Yeah, I've heard a lot of experts confess that too. Um, I had William Gates in my office several years ago, and he was, we were talking about it, and he, he confessed, he said, no, there, there's no way that string theory is ever going to say anything about the standard model. Mm -hmm. I can get you on record saying that. And he said, no, no, don't. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I know, I've encountered a lot of them who say that. Yes, so I think that at least uh, says that we need new ideas, uh, I mean, which may be partly stringy, but definitely would have show a clear departure from the axioms or assumptions of uh, string theory. Yeah, they might have some things that can be used in that. Like, it, like with the Clifford algebra models, it looks like if you want three generations, you want creation and annihilation operators and everything, it looks like you need something like CL10, which kind of matches with their um, mm -hmm. dimensional space time. So maybe some aspects of what they're doing. Yes, yes. So it, it's remarkable that anomaly cancellation is in 10D 
and 10 d is very natural in some sense like you say for clipper yeah, so algebra like yeah. yeah so that commonality i agree so i i i personally believe that the quantum to classical transition is what engineers effective compactification we don't compactify by brute force but uh, the quant quantum systems always live in uh, 10d even at low energies uh, that's my picture it's classical systems which live in 4d and uh, they are trying to overdo compactification. They want to put quantum systems also down to 4D and the Clifford algebra picture, I think doesn't seem to agree with that. Well, in the, the way I approach the extra dimensions is that they're not dimensions you can travel in. They're just degrees of freedom. They have no extensibility and that just I completely have, yeah. gets rid of them. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, would that put them in the fiber bundles uh, so sort of? Would you put it that way? I mean, they are not really space-time dimensions. They're like the extra degrees of freedom which belong to the gauge field fiber. Yeah, they're, they're a structure of the algebra. The algebra is, the universe is fundamentally built on a certain algebra, and it doesn't yes. mean that you can move in those higher dimensions. Just... Yes, yes. So, yes. So would you call them internal degrees of freedom in some sense, whatever that word internal means? I still refer to them as dimensions because in the Clifford algebra, they act exactly like that, but they have no extensibility. You can't move in the like the E7 direction or something like that. I see. They form, a, they form the basis for the components of the scalar fields, like the Higgs field, things like that. And it might be that it's a first approximation to something where they... It does involve curve space time or something like that, but I don't. You know, I, I come from the other end of things. I, I, I worked at KAK. I'm well aware of everything in the standard model. I want to understand what's in the standard model first. So I'm going from the standard model outwards, not going from some crazy ideas and trying to work backwards to the standard model, which seems to be what but they're trying to do. Can we entertain the possibility that leptons and quarks live in different a number of dimensions so quarks may leptons may be four or six d but quarks are 10 d that's my naive way of looking at confinement you cannot bring a quark down from 10 space time dimensions to four unless you make the collection of quarks color neutral color neutrality is effectively the same thing as being in 4 d i mean uh, uh, this may be very naive but at least it, it it looks at first sight it looks attractive color is a geometry color is geometry of extra dimension that's what we find color color is not a quantum number like electric charge or mass it's you know, it's a very different feel to it and that the different feel is like different colors are these different extra dimensions which leptons don't, which leptons don't have. And what is your explanation or language for SU2 weak? SU, okay, great, great you asked. Currently, what I'm excited about, the Clifford algebra CL2, CL3 structure suggesting that SU2R is the precursor of gravity, which is the geometry of our 4D space time. But there is a second space time, which is also a part of our universe. It's like if I have a torus, it has two directions. One is, let's say, very big. The other is very small. These are like two space times. So every particle actually lives in this, both these 4D space time. SU2L, the weak force, should be the geometry of the other 4D space time and somehow these two 4d space times talk to each other so su2 l cross su2 r are two 4d space times each one of them has a fiber bundle on top su2 l has su3 color and su2 r has another new su3 what we talked about earlier the su3 grab it's very pleasing to think of the weak force as the geometry of a counterpart uh, space time. The weak force and GR should be in par. 
Okay. Okay. Did that make some sense? <laughs> yeah. Right now we think of weak force as the internal symmetry. Seems more, it's more like a space-time symmetry of a second 4D space-time, which is also a part of uh, our universe. So uh, in that Taurus kind of example. And a lot of the models are fine. There is no um, SU2, right? And I don't have gravity in it at all. Okay, okay. The, the models yeah. do the People use the slight... L7 model that you, that's what you're referring to? It's just a toy model that's, but it doesn't have a SU2, right? It's completely removed because that would mix the components of the Higgs and it wouldn't transform correctly, so. Yeah, you mentioned that, you mentioned that. Yeah, we talked about it, yes. Yeah, so I don't know in what way your model differs Other people from. Six one and CL seven and CL eight, and I've seen CL nine, and and then they they put octonions in, and you know, there's all different variations. Somebody is right. We don't know, but somebody's going to be right. If enough okay. people, try, somebody's going to. The main thing is to get the three generations somehow, and I'm banging my head against the wall. I can't seem to get it to work. But this exceptional Jordan algebra J three eight, that's not good for the fermions that they have to come out in a renormalizable way. They can't be any kind of fixed constraints and that's really tricky to do. And mm -hmm. That's okay. why it's been, it's been bang, banging away at this trying to get it to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, okay. So Ashutosh, yeah, that's trying to answer uh, your, uh, so I want to be able to prove that the weak force, the SU2L is the geometry of a counterpart space time, but it, it's definitely more like a space time symmetry. It's not an internal symmetry in the sense in which QCD or SU3 color is an internal symmetry. That's a true internal symmetry, but uh, SU2L is uh, not uh, to my understanding. Okay, okay. Yeah, it sounds is... to me as an experimentalist and from your perspective that there is something awkward or odd about the Higgs. The way the standard model makes SU2 weak, weak is through the spontaneous breaking by the Higgs of the gauge symmetry. That's the language for which yeah. we are following all this time. Yes. But but in that language, SU two weak is a broken gauge symmetry. That is true. So in your language, it never starts out being a broken gauge symmetry. So now I can ask the question, it never starts out as a gauge symmetry in the first place. It's not an internal symmetry like electromagnetism or QCD. Then what is the Higgs doing? So I think- No, no, the Higgs, the Higgs still is important how it is placed so that this counterpart space-time from the point of view of our space-time has to look like a standard model SU2 internal symmetry with the Higgs doing precisely what you are saying. So that correspondence is yet to be understood. There, before the electroweak symmetry breaking, there is E8 cross E8. When the symmetry breaks, then the internal symmetry separates from space-time. In the unification phase, unified phase, the internal symmetry and the space-time symmetry together become one unified E8 cross E8 symmetry. And I don't talk of space-time anymore. There is something, the octonionic space, then the electroweak symmetry happens and uh, the Higgs does give mass to the W and Z, but in such a way that I should be allowed to think of SU2L as a space-time symmetry of a second space-time, which from the point of view of standard QFT on 4D space-time looks like the standard model internal symmetry. I, we need to get there. That is the hope. We don't, we don't want to confront a conflict with something which is already done in a very uh, believable way, like in a spontaneous symmetry breaking. 
Yeah, and in my models, it's done exactly the same way as the standard model with the gauging of the, the symmetries. And there, there's a later paper about two years later that shows you get the high energy limit of the Weinberg angle, the same as you would get from SU5, but you don't need yeah. SU5. Okay, SU2 then do you use have a calculation for the weak angle, Weinberg angle? Yeah, that was in a paper about presented at a conference about it was no big deal because it ended up being the same as what you got from SU5. It's just there is no SU5 in my model. It's just the SU2 on the one side and the SU3 operates. Point to the 30 degrees or more like what we see in data? It was the, the high, I have to go back and look. The high energy limit was like sine squared is three eighths or something like that. And it okay. works out to be two, three. Eight. Eight. Okay. That's it's the same result as you got from SU5. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I, I thought you were saying something. It's that shifts as you go to lower energies, the you know, the energies you see in accelerators. Mm -hmm. So my question was whether if you were to probe the Higgs at higher and higher energy or smaller and smaller size or better coupling measurements. At what point would you say that you don't expect the Higgs to behave exactly like? In your exactly. theory, it's not just some arbitrarily picked out of a hat scalar field, right? Yes, yes. So a naive not. guess about the electroweak symmetry breaking scale, we should not be seeing the Higgs at all the Higgs and the quarks, leptons and the gauge bosons all together, all of them together, go into a quote unquote new state. These are some different kinds of uh, states with some uh, associated quantum number of one by three. That's what the theory is suggesting. Uh, so like how to probe about the electroweak scale without using uh, particle-based probes. That is a very... Uh... Okay. Okay. Do, does that make sense? Yeah, please, Gregory. Okay, so I think our recording will come to an end. So maybe we could also wind up. Anyone, anything more, please? Okay, as always, we had a great discussion. Good. So see you in September now, on 1st September. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you for joining.